And uh, by the way, uh, sorry, not to put Boshkar on the spot, but he's actually with Caltrans. I lured him in, so we'll, we'll let him do an intro in a little bit, so. Yeah, I am I'm, uh, the novice here, so I'm just listening <laughs> to all the, all the great minds. <laughs> Welcome, Boshkar. Anyway. Well, thanks a lot. So should we, uh, Tony, as you mentioned, should we just do, I guess, brief intros for, uh, why don't we go around the room? I think it's just, you know, we have two new members just to get everyone acquainted. We may have some other folks uh, coming in. Um, okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds so good. it looks like there's a chat. Um, yeah, we'll just go around the room again. So Walter, you, uh, Caltrans, and, you know, previously worked, you know, in previous data challenges. And, you know, we'll be going over the, um, you know, the Jupyter Notebook or Google Collaboratory Notebook. And um, I guess we can, as far as uh, intros go, we can go just alpha, you know, we'll go down, I guess, down the list. So uh, Tony Scale, Hot, or Scott Taylor. So on to you, Tony. All right, yeah. So uh, happy to co-lead this breakout room with Walter. Um, and I work with SFEI, where I'm Program Director of Environmental Informatics. Um, with respect to trash, I'm uh, the co-PI on a trash monitoring methods evaluation project uh, funded by OPC. And you can find more information at trashmonitoring.org. So uh, that's really kind of where I come in. I'm going to pass it on uh, to uh, Scott. Thanks, Tony. I'm a research scientist here in the State Water Board and the Division of Drinking Water and have been studying plastic and its effects on marine organisms and humans for about five or six years. Uh, uh, dabble in data science and happy to be here. And Eric, can you uh, remind us of your affiliation and interest? Yeah, so uh, I'm a scientific aide with Region 5. Um, and I said before, like my interest in AI was actually from my hobby in game development, where I generated content. And I specifically got to use Python at work to like process a bunch of website information and download documents, I automated it, making it so much faster and that's like yeah let's let's do those processes so that's why i'm here today and i was at the last data thon and it's it's an interesting problem with all this data nice sounds good hey taylor taylor from fusco do you want to explain yeah. your interest? so i'm with fusco engineering i'm just a programmer i don't really know much about all the water stuff um but i'm in the process of developing a trash ai model to uh, replace some of the boring work of walking, doing OVTAs, uh, and trying to replace that with uh, AI. Great. And uh, Bhaskar, you you talked about uh, your um, your Caltrans affiliation, but can you tell us a little bit more about the work you do there? Okay. Good morning. I am Bhaskar Joshi. I work for Caltrans in the Division of Environment, and uh, we deal with the uh, statewide water monitoring and, and BMP development. Walter, you at one time used to work in a sister office with us, and uh, we developed some of the you know machine learning recognition program for the trash uh, uh, problem we have. So we are on the side of on the other side of the table, compliance side, and we are looking for ways to how to how to monitor trash, how to, you know, actually treat for it. And uh, uh, we have operational problems is uh, as we go out into the field, we don't want to expose our manpower in the field. So all these automated systems will help us if, you know, we can figure out, you know, where the trash is, how is it moving from where to where, and how does it actually get into receiving waters? That's one of our problems. We see a lot of trash on the freeways, but does that trash end up migrating into the receiving waters. Uh, we have a lot of parallel efforts going on with Caltrans. We pick up trash, we have adopt a highway, we have all the other efforts that we do sweeping, et cetera. And uh, this is actually unknown is, uh, does that less than five millimeter trash on the, from the freeway get into the receiving waters? Less so than or more than? than? Less than or more than five millimeters? That is so less than uh, so the the great the sieve size is five millimeter. We are supposed to put nets that have five millimeter openings. So if it is less than five millimeter, it gets through, 
and uh, more than five meters step but now we are hearing microplastics so you know that will get through so <laughs> i mean the problem gets compounded day by day um, yeah, no, that I, the reason why I, I'm, I'm very interested in this, Baskar, and I don't, I don't want to get us off track, but by focusing on microplastics, um, I wonder, you, you mentioned before that you're on the, you, you're a regulated entity, of course, and so you yeah. are mindful of compliance. Uh, if, are there current drivers for compliance that are speaking to microplastics at this point? Uh, yes, there has been a recent uh, study out of Washington. Uh, I think you might know uh, a big, uh, you know, it's, it's a very, what do you call, path-breaking study where they discovered that tire wear particles are causing us to release some chemicals that are killing all the fish over there. You know, maybe in yeah, the coho, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's all microplastics and that's coming off our highways. We know that, but what do we do about it? And how do we, first of all, measure it? Whether it is a problem, you know, all that is unknown at this point. Okay, well, I'm, I'm really glad that you're mindful of that. In fact, an SFEI scientist contributed to that article, so I'm very familiar with it. I just wasn't aware that it had been uh, incorporated into uh, actual regulatory compliance at this point. Yeah, not yet. But I'm, I'm, glad to, I'm glad that you're out ahead of it and you are thinking about best ways to, uh, to, to mitigate for the microplastics. So that's, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, Ying, we never actually, we heard from you yesterday, but, um, and I, I think I was a neglectful uh, host, uh, co-host here in that I didn't really get clarity on your affiliation, Ying, and your, uh, the nature, I kind of got a sense of your interest, but it would be great to kind of hear you share with us that the work that you're doing with AI and, and machine learning and, and maybe even uh, this kind of uh, programming opportunities in general. Thank you. Uh, I am a professor at the Sac State. Um, my research concentration is database systems. So mainly my work is related to like a query processing and algorithms of uh, more like a um, low level uh, query processing details. Uh, so uh, I have some work related to regression problem for supervised machine learning. Um, so I'm glad. <laughs> I mean, this kind of a break uh, room and I'll be able to learn more from uh, you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Jin. It's, it's great to have you on board. And um, uh, thank you for uh, sharing your, your affiliation there. I didn't realize we, we had a, a, a data science professor amongst our, our midst here. That's, that's fantastic. Um, well, I think, did, Walter, did, I think we covered everybody, right? Yeah, we did. So welcome everyone. And uh, yeah, and I think as we, uh, I think what we'll do is we'll start with a recap from just very quickly uh, from last yesterday, especially the second half. So let me share the screen here. So let me make sure we get the right stuff. Okay, here we go. Is that good? Can everybody see this screen, the slides? Yep. Okay, perfect. So, and I put the link to the full presentation in the chat. So feel free to, you know, browse. It's got all the links that uh, we're going to be working on today. And so, wanted to do a recap from basically the uh, intro to AI machine learning. So we talked, uh, you know, had some good discussion around this mind map around what are the different categories of AI. It's a very broad field, a lot of different applications, and so. This is just one representation or a taxonomy of how the different, basically applications or algorithms. So you know, we talked, you know, a lot about uh, basically, you know, it, when it relates to trash monitoring, that predictive is, you know, would be is, is a very common use case and is of interest of trash monitoring. So especially for classification of trash levels. So say for us at Caltrans, we'd like to do some data analysis or prediction of trash levels based on say our, our maintenance crews doing pickup, a prediction would be a good one to do classification. I think as uh, you know, we just talked about this morning, uh, this was with Scott's project is that, well, there's natural language processing available, we need to parse a database of text. And so it's kind of bridging that gap between structured data of something in a database and an actual text and, and uh, you know, basically raw text or, or processing and tokenizing it. And then the ones in the middle here, again, we talked about, but, you know, don't apply as much to, you know, again, I think robotics, we know that there's, there's works with recycling and things like that and detection. And it, and it actually, it's almost like a twofold from, 
you know, both doing a computer vision. So whatever machine is picking up and sorting this trash has to identify it, and then the robotics to then actually do the sorting. So it's actually more than just one, you know, robotics on its own. And then we also talked a lot, and there was a lot of interest in it yesterday morning around computer vision. So Tony Hill had, uh, or Tony had shared uh, it, a lot of uh, good knowledge around the SFBI project using drones. So it's actually there in the slide deck. So you, you know, you scroll up from this slide. I also provide an overview, and so did Taylor of our respective projects doing OBTAs. Um, and so ours is, you know, along the diff diff different parts of the highway and in the Bay Area. And then uh, Taylor's project is down based in Irvine, uh, using uh, looking at local streets, whereas you know ours looked obviously at the highways. Um, any questions or feedback? Did we do uh, the just okay, just cool. one thing to just one thing to add, uh, which really speaks to Scott that the, the quick mini uh, presentation you just delivered. Um, you, you, you said, you know, you want to follow up. Uh, we're in this artificial intelligence group, so I think it's, it's worth sharing that uh, I, I made an acquaintance in doing some of this uh, artificial intelligence research. Um, someone who works with the, um, with the diplomatic wing of the State Department um, and who uh, is essentially mining a, uh, more documents than what humans can can read on a manual basis, looking for certain patterns um, uh, in uh, in different in various languages. Uh, so so as to prepare the diplomatic corps for their work um, in in engaging with uh, different nations around the world. Um, and so, you know, some of this has to do with, I'm sure, kind of, um, uh, um, uh, you know, because it is the diplomatic wing, they're trying to mitigate wars. And so it's very important to have as much accurate intelligence uh, as possible. So, you know, something like that is not, not, uh, not scientific in, as far as the subject that's being studied, but their, um, their technological approach has to be as accurate and precise as possible so as to promote um, good relations with their um, with their target uh, nations, and so uh, it, it it this the, the work that he's been doing has been years long. So he's been pursuing this natural language processing for for now a number of years, and has made some breakthroughs recently. So I think it would be maybe worth. I I don't I don't know how much how much you know. I I would imagine this is a very well funded you know, project that he's leading, maybe like multi-million dollar deal. So it's probably not equivalent to the types of things you might be able to do on a shoestring. Uh, but these these uh, strides have an effect of having the kind of the pioneers expending a lot of R&D dollars to kind of make the progress. And then often pieces of them are more, more um, popularly shared. And so there may be some downstream things that, you know, the Googles of the world and Microsofts might be might be uh, making available. I don't know about those connections. I don't know about what the downstream effects of this are, but I do know that that you know he was using supercomputers powered by GPUs to churn through many many volumes of, of literature and you know journal articles, journal articles um, as well as newspapers and a bunch of things to kind of mine all the, this information. It wasn't image based. It was it was language based. And uh, it, 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 I could see, for instance, the as far as the classification and clustering, um, it would be amazing to have your tool linking to the actual text that is relevant to the the different binnings and different all the various ways that you're filtering to be able to call the call the text up in some kind of organized structured way. So to apply structure where there is none. So when Walter was talking about unstructured data versus structured data, this is clearly, I would say it begins as mostly unstructured, at least if you're gonna be mining the language. You talked also about mining the data, but it might be mining the metadata, right? I mean, isn't that, I mean, that's a lot of what you're doing is trying to get a sense of what the data are. Um, so that I could see maintaining the connections, even as all these things are being filtered and the natural language processing as a way to uh, apply structure and maintain the links uh, as things are being sliced and diced. Wow, <laughs> that's really, really cool. I mean, that seems like sort of the new era of the internet, right? To have like a Wikipedia that links to every other article that 
like within the article that it's pulling the information from and without having a human to curate it or even mine it in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, I, it might be a little bit outside the scope of like what we're intending to do with our app, but I, I could see how using the NLP for my, for mining would be really, really useful. And I'd, I'd love to uh, connect further. I'll, I'm going to reach out to, to this, this Washingtonian, uh, and see if I can um, get back in touch with them. The last time I talked to him was was actually about two years ago at the, at, no, gosh, it feels like two years ago, but it was one year ago. Um, that's how that's how time works these days. Um, but yeah, I, we met at the GPU conference in, in Washington, uh, DC. So it'd be good to get back in touch with them. So I'll let you know what, what I come up with. Cool. Yeah, I'd say Scott too. You could probably you, you should you could probably check out the R packages for NLP. I'm sure there's you know there's like uh, NLT tape or Python, but I'm sure you could find a you know compares you know comparable one for an R. And then just to kind of get your feet wet, and then I'm, I'm sure you know there's plenty of examples, obviously, because um, it'll be pretty popular. Uh, you know, R machine learning is getting a lot of traction, so there's like parallel basically you know libraries that you use in R. Cool. Awesome, and I'm actually, I, I think you, you all convinced me to learn a little bit of Python. I figured out that you can actually run Python in our studio, so. Yeah, there you, and vice versa. So I, I put a link, I'll, I'll share it, uh, but I actually shared out a notebook uh, with, uh, with R and Colab, so vice versa. Um, and I don't know, yeah, I think we talked also yesterday about either you know, running locally or in the cloud. So the example we have from being Colab, just kind of lowest common denominator, right? Everybody can just hopefully run it, we'll get there. But if you're running it locally, uh, I found that Anaconda was pretty nice because you can kind of keep everything and you keep the, keep the different environments there. So it's just one way if you're going to play in both, it's, it's to, to keep them straight pretty much. So, Yeah, and our, our um, TensorFlow-based image uh, computer vision was running an Anaconda environment. So that's a good example. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, okay, well, thanks for the feedback there. So yeah, this is the... The general mind map with you and then again i, I think it'll be illustrated those are some of the, the use cases as it applies to trash monitoring and next slide i think this is again will be demonstrated in the notebook that we're going to go through today so really get our hands dirty with data science and machine learning uh, step by step obviously but link to this article around the basic data science workflow so Again, very broad categories. There's going to be, you know, each one of these would probably have their own list. And you, there are like books just on each one of these, like how to do just on data analysis and exploratory analysis, right? There's each one of these is they're almost in their own right, a, a topic, but in general, data collection and acquisition. So obviously in trash monitoring, that's going to be a big one, right? Whether it's images or trash data or like Scott, right? You have an entire database to go through. So there's a whole trove or, or like when, right? They don't even, you know, where is all the data? And so I think that's this is still continuing to, to evolve with as far as especially trash data. Uh, EDA or exploratory data analysis is once we get the data, getting a sense of it. So, you know, really like Scott's app with, you know, showing the different, you know, you could, you could toggle and get a sense of the data, really doing that. You know, I know that that's a final where you actually done the filtering and the modeling. But, you know, again, we'll demonstrate in the notebook, just again, the power visualization, getting a peek at the data before we start analyzing it. And then item number three, again, like we talked about, is just data cleaning. And so uh, a lot of data comes in. Uh, you know, the open data sets that I have in the slides later on, they're actually really probably a best case. They're clean and tidy. But in most cases, uh, you know, they're going to be missing values. They're going to be, you know, all sorts of things that are off. And uh, so, that you know, that's a big step in, in data cleaning and treating them so that they can fit a model. And then step four is the model selection. So what is the problem that we're trying to solve? And, and again, it speaks to this taxonomy. So I think we talked about what are the, the different types of problems you're trying to solve. And so even if you're doing prediction, if you have a numeric or a categorical, depending on the type of value you like to predict, your model may change. And so that's where the model selection comes in. And I know there was some good discussion yesterday around uh, what, are, what is a good way to do model selection. And I think we can talk with, speak a little bit more to that during the notebook. And, and maybe the choices that I made. And, and I think we talked, we looked at the scikit-learn documentation, just as an example, you know, laying out visually how the different, you know, categories and things like that lay out. And then uh, step number five is, you know, once we, and again, this is not, we train the, we, you know, we're gonna be dead set on the first one we select. It's really just the experimental and uh, 
you know, trial, trial and error method, you know, method of doing a training and test model. So you, you may select one, say, you know, again, I, I stick with random forest because it tends to perform pretty well, right? They're in the kind of common literature uh, out of the box, it tend to be pretty good. Uh, and, you know, it's a pretty general one, a good one to start with. But again, you know, that may not be the best fit, uh, pun intended. And we might, we might move on to other models that have a better fit, or we may learn something along the way as we're developing that model. And then the, and, and even for computer vision, there's different types of, of uh, common uh, neural nets, right? So depending on the type of uh, model that was used, you know, we may update that as we, as we do our train test. And then finally, model refinement. So again, this is holistically, once we've actually run the model, going back and taking a look. I think one example I pointed out was after I had developed that CoLab notebook, I figured out that, wow, okay, looking at, you know, the, the actual dis uh, distribution plot that it may be imbalanced, right? We have a lot of scores on the, on the lower medium. So maybe one of the tweaks we could do today is, well, how do we treat that imbalanced data set? Maybe we do some treatment to it to again and see if there's an improvement in the accuracy. Um, and Walter, right, before, I move Walter on, before you move yeah. on, I just wanted to kind of probe something here. Sure. So there, there, I think that there are some very useful distinctions between the, the graphic and the ordering of the tasks on the left. So if we were to look at it a little bit more closely, you got the model selection number four, the train test model number five, and the model refinement number six, not really appearing within the data science workflow, but that's okay because I think that you, you might assert that those those four bits really um, kind of uh, replace the final analysis and reporting in the context of the artificial intelligence machine learning, right? Mm -hmm. That is, they are they're helping to facilitate all of that. So it's yeah, I think it's interesting to see this the distinction between the specific um, artificial intelligence workflow that you've pointed out on the left hand side, and then the general data science workflow and needing to make sure that it's clear that when you're doing the kind of model selection and the, the training of the model and the model refinement, that what you're doing is you are helping to facilitate the, the final analysis and the, and the reporting from that. Correct, yes. Good points there, all right. Um, so again, I think we, you know, and I can spend, I can speak to this for a little bit here. I think we were, um, you know, trying to get to the demos yesterday, but and, you know, again, we'll see this within the, you know, the notebook. And again, I, I did my best. I know there's a R package for computer vision. It escapes me for the moment because I've seen them used on spatial analysis, uh, aerial imagery. So actually, uh, I take that back for spatial imagery or spatial analysis that are spatial. It's a pretty big package. It's pretty robust. If you, if, you know, one ever needed to do it in R. Uh, computer vision, I'm not quite sure, but I'm, I'm, I'm almost certain there's going to be one. Uh, so today, data analysis, uh, we'll get to it in a notebook. So I think, as Eric pointed out, doing data processing, uh, doing downloads, things like that, we'll cover that in R using uh, the NumPy and Pandas uh, packages, which are pretty common for that task. For R, there's Tidyverse, right, which is a bundle of other libraries which are very useful, including dplyr. So dplyr is a very is, is kind of an, an analogous to uh, Py or uh, Py Pandas in R, and then data visualization again just there's many, right? But uh, matplotlib seems to be a pretty popular one for Python, and then uh, ggplot2, among others, right? There's like Lattice and other things for R. Machine learning, again, scikit-learn for what we're trying to do for prediction is a good one. Again, there's, you know, it seems to be at least at the moment the, the front runner and then carrot for R. And then for computer vision, initially a lot in Python, but there's other ones coming up in R as well. Sorry. And the, there is, you know, one one of the R based is uh, something called R Vision. Uh, oh, it's good. under Swarm Lab. So if you just Google Google that, All right, let me... it's on GitHub. Okay, perfect. Let me update the slides. Then. Uh, on their GitHub, it says it's failing, and then it's not published on CRAN, so it might not oh, be ready. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the the dangers of open source sometimes. Well, when we find one, we can we can update the slide. There we go. All right. So, proposed projects. I think this is where we uh, where we left yesterday. So I'll just do do a very quick recap, and then we'll dive in. So this is the one I think by majority vote. Uh, you know, and again, we can, we're open to working on it. You know, there's some other items here, right? So I'll just do a walkthrough of these couple of slides, but. There's a, there's a Google Colab notebook, uh, which we'll be working with. So everybody can just, I'll, I'll do the screen share. Everybody else can just create a copy. 
Uh, hopefully you have a Google account. We can make some of the arrangements. You can also download it as a, as a notebook and I'll show you guys how to do that. And, uh, and then that way, hopefully everybody can run it. And then uh, there's also, of course, you know, basically all the files I showed yesterday have their own. I've also stored them on my GitHub. So if you ever want a backup copy or for any reason, you can always either re recopy the notebook itself or you're free to, you know, look at the actual, um, the files themselves as far as the Python scripts. And then the full data set for the city of LA geostat or clean stat is uh, here. And we did a review yesterday on that data set, uh, which basically is uh, trash level scores through the city of LA during their surveys. Any uh, feedback here? Pause for a moment. Okay. And then I'll just do, uh, you know, kind of a, as, as other options, right? We might weave into it. We might have some time or, you know, folks are also interested in those. Uh, here's the one, uh, Scott is the, you know, this is the notebook that I created using uh, R. So it actually has, you know, pre-configured. It also has random forest pre-configured using, uh, it's not a trash data set. I used it with, for a Coursera course, but feel free to swap it out, reference the code. It uses Carrot. One warning is I don't know, Carrot takes a while to download. I can't figure out any way, like even with Colab running, which is pretty fast usually, as you'll see in the Python, it kind of bogs down. But anyway, just a heads up. And then there's a, the, you know, the, the GitHub repository as usual. And then there's an article, article two for reference. If you want to just set up from scratch your own, um, basically you're going to import a library, which enables you to basically run, R. you know, there's a, there's a package you install it and then you're good to go with your code up. Computer vision. I was just working on this, but there is a stock template for object detection uh, in Colab for those of you that might want to wander down that beaten path. Um, you know, again, we're gonna work on that classifier mostly, but um, you know, basically it's available. And just to demonstrate, you can run computer. This is really one of the primary purposes that initially Google created Colab before was to run TensorFlow. So this is uh, an example that they've developed. And then if we have time data visualization, so given that the trash data set we looked at from City of LA has geospatial data, I've also linked another notebook that I did for Code for America. We, we did a similar kind of hackathon more around civic, what we call civic hacking. And in that we did uh, equity map. So we wanted to demonstrate what is what are the levels of access to low income communities within the Sacramento area, because it's, you know, it's our brigade. But basically there's a notebook that uses the Python folding package to do mapping in, in Python. So it basically grabs uh, geospatial data uh, typically like uh, boundary layers, things like that. And, uh, you know, it'll actually consume them from the Esri Hub, these open data portals, which we'll share in, in, on the next slide. But, you know, on the right here is a, an example visualization of what, what they call, um, what do they call it? A, a chloroplast plot. So basically it's just a heat map. So in this case, these, these are the parcels of low income communities uh, in the white and within Sacramento area based on the, one of the data sets from SACOG, the Sacramento uh, area county of governments coalition of governments and then the green i believe were i think the poverty the white was all the parcels and then i think the green was the scale i have to dig a little bit into the legend here but it's just a kind of an illustration of what you can do with the mapping and we can dive into that um, if we have time last slide here are some open data sets again you know wasn't quite sure you know where folks wanted to head but you know, again, these are pretty good examples. So two of the ones are the statewide ones, obviously the California Open Data Portal for tabular data, California Geo Portal for open geospatial data. So feel free to take a look at those. And then these two, I figured, again, if we wanted to look at, say, trash level, trash level for equity, because it seems like there's there's a some interest potentially, right? But, um, you know, basically uh, SCAG is Southern California, and then SACOG is for Sacramento, right? Because waterborne, you know, we're, we're kind of, I guess, looking at one data set, but maybe geographically in another, but feel free to look at those. And, and again, these are these all have really good examples of uh, good representative kind of clean, tidy data sets. And then they're also in a really friendly format to consume them, you, either as GeoJSON or, um, you know, tabular CSV downloads. And then it makes it easier, really easy to work with within uh, something like Python Notebook. So I'll pause here for, Questions, feedback? Okay, hearing none for now. I think what we'll do is, so uh, we'll start off with uh, the Python notebook. So this is on, if you're following along, I believe I'm gonna exit out here. I believe this is on slide 
30, if you're following along on, uh, on your end. And I have gone ahead and pulled, sorry, I was looking up logos, articles, and this is just a template for TensorFlow. I gotta find, sorry. Here we go, let's just open up a new, here we go. So I'm gonna open this up. And so just go ahead and click the, on the link. And then this is my copy so I can edit it. But if you're new and go ahead and make yourself a copy. So what you would do is you would save a copy in Drive and I know I'm not, I'm not going to assume that everybody has a Google account. So I guess, let me ask you this. If you're, is anyone having issues if you're not able to, um, you know, make a copy to your, to your drive? Otherwise you can go ahead and download it as well. So this will download to your local. This will be the, uh, you know, what they call the, the Python notebook. So you'll have the notebook file. So um, I'm going to proceed, and uh, so you know, again, go ahead and create a copy to your to your drive, and then I'll go ahead and just do a very you know quick run through. And I know some of you may have already worked with uh, Colab in the past, but you know, just want to illustrate again. This feels a lot like Google Docs, and when you copy this to uh, your drive, you should see it. in the, it may create, I think. Um, Tony, do you know, does it create a kind of like, it creates a new folder for you or, or where does it save? Does it save on like home when you save it? Sorry, you're on mute. Here Sorry. Go. So I, I would imagine it saves on the My Drive mute. I haven't done it myself. I'll do it right now and, and mm -hmm. see how it turns out. Yeah, I created a folder called Colab Notebooks and put it in there. Yeah, exactly. So it'll be in your Colab Notebooks and then th there you'll, you know, and again, if you find others that you like, uh, typically, and you do, you, you know, if you open one up, say from Google, like the one I was looking at for image recognition, you'll go through the same process. So anytime you borrow a template, and I think it's a pretty good way to get started. You just, you know, you go up here and you save a copy, and it'll all go to your code app. It'll keep it together. And then again, if you wanted to work locally for any reason, you can always download the entire notebook. And then again, this feels a lot like Google Docs. Um, I think the, the thing to note as usual is you could. You know, save from time to time. You can also do Control S if you're if you're working the document. Um, this is again, if you want to have a new notebook, start from scratch. If you want to integrate with GitHub, if you can, I, I don't. I usually just run it locally when I do it. Um, but you know, again, there's 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 a way to link it to your version control. Um, I'll get to kind of the way the cells work. Um, this is probably not the most efficient way to do it. You probably don't want to toggle up and down every time. I'll show you how to navigate through the cells as we go. Walter, yes. uh, before you move, before you move on, um, we, uh, you and I were talking about the the trade offs of running it through in the Google environment or just doing it on your own. Um, do you do you want to kind of uh, talk about what the uh, ups and downs are of, of doing that? Um, I think so. Yes. Uh, so if yes, I think it's a good recap. So. Basically, uh, this runs externally. So obviously, if you're, you know, basically Jupyter actually has a kernel, right? So you could deploy it. every organization can basically run Jupyter, and it wouldn't it wouldn't look like this per se. It would look like the Jupyter, you know, like the usual stuff you have in your desktop. So Google, what Google has done is they've deployed it and, and added a whole bunch of stuff, which makes it really easy to use. But the downside is yes, you're basically external. So you have, if you have sensitive data. And also, you're not able to say connect up your own database, right? If you have Jupyter running on your notebook, there's actually drivers, and I've, I've worked, you know, on our work laptops here at Caltrans, is you can actually have drivers that connect to a database, so you don't have to do the upload and things like that. Um, on the other hand, um, you know, if you're running on the Google infrastructure, obviously integrates very nicely for Google Drive. It's super easy to, to share because you know you'll you'll notice that when you look at your your folder and drive, you could just share it like a Google Doc. So the same way I shared a presentation with you, you'll see from this URL, like you could share it very easily. And then also the UI makes it very approachable, um, makes it harder to break things, so to speak, uh, less of a learning curve. And then also the, the performance tends to generally be pretty good. And you don't have to worry about, um, especially for the image recognition stuff, I found that, um, it's, and also maybe that's the other caveat, is that especially in, for TensorFlow, they, they've optimized it. And so the runtime and the way it runs tends to be pretty good. 
And um, so, yeah, I think those, did I miss anything as far as- kind of Well, I'm wondering about version control for libraries and things. It's, it, do, you, do you have the ability to use different uh, libraries linked to this or is it just kind of, uh, they always give you the latest version of any library? It will, I believe what you do, and I, I don't, I, I could do, I haven't gotten a chance to research it. What I found is it looks like for almost all the common libraries, I found like, let me scroll down to the code real quick. I don't even have to do a pip install. Like, I think they just, I think Colab, they just maintain like the version for you. Like I didn't do pip install on this. Right. I just started from scratch and it gave it to me. So I assume that it's like Anaconda where uh, I think Colab does some maintenance for you um, behind the scenes, I think. Um, but that's a good question. I think the other would be if you really wanted to be sure, yes, you could probably use a package manager like uh, Pip or Conda. Um, but obviously for kind of just demonstration, I just, you know, took the easiest path. But um, you yeah, also, Walter, would... have the ability to address, um, to more easily address uh, Google Google uh, data sources like Google Sheets and maybe even Google Earth Engine through the collab um, because it's 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 all in the cloud. Yes, and you use them as data sources and and repositories. Yes, I think I would assume that they probably you may be able to find templates. I haven't looked, but yes, I think they probably have. And I think it was here was where they talk. Yes, working with data. Here we go. Loading data from Drive Sheets and Google Cloud Storage, but, and also from uh, their data warehouse. So it looks like they're, uh, yes, I think it, there's probably some code that they have and, and ways to uh, import very easily from you know other their other products. And so right. uh, there's linkages there as well. To work so that's with kind data. of the flip side of, you know, if you have your local environment, then you can address your local databases very, you know, fairly straightforwardly. Uh, if it's in the Google Collab, it's really easy to address those other Google resources in a very easy way. Yep, that's a really good point. Yes. So I, I think there's some options here. And then, um, yeah, and, and I think as we walk through this notebook, um, you know, I'll just highlight these links as we go. But yes, I think there's kind of the ups and downs of, um, you know, I guess pros and cons of, of each. So, um, you know, again, yeah, if you experiment and work on your own, if you want to continue uh, tweaking this, then, you know, probably be good to, you know, just as an experiment, be good to stay in notebook. If you say wanted to adapt this to something on your local, on your database or on your machine, then probably what you want to do is you want to do a download and then you can work on your own. Um, so, yeah. That's How good is the machine learning crash course uh, listed there? Is that something you've, you, you've experimented with? And, and, uh, and, and by the way, uh, Bhaskar, if you, if you have any, uh, it, experience with any of these, it'd, it'd be great to hear from you. Let's see if he can hear us. Uh, not sure if he, yeah, Bosch might be on mute. Yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, it's, it's nice to have recommendations of different resources that people can mine because, you know, there, there can be a steep learning curve for all of this. So Definitely. If there's a quick way to come up to speed. That's great. I would say actually, so these are look like they're individual notebooks. So these are actually really good. If uh, if we want to spend time on these, we can. They actually look like they're pretty good. Like this one is just for pandas. This is just for data frames. And so, you know, again, all interactive using the same tools. And again, I think we could, yeah, if, we, if folks want to, uh, you know, they, they really step through, you know, what are the different data structures you would need for working with data, representing them within Python, you know, how nulls and things like that. So that looks like it's pretty good. Uh, obviously, TensorFlow is kind of out of scope here. Um, I would say this one was probably pretty, you know, but something like this. And I would say their resources in general, yes, are pretty good. Actually, mm -hmm. I know when I first started looking at TensorFlow, I looked at a lot of their materials. They also actually have um, I believe like YouTube videos, all sorts of stuff. They're pretty good about doing the education around and training for them as well. So I think, let's see, this might be, yes. So they actually have, yeah, yeah there we go. Here we go. So yeah, I've looked at this before and I actually recommended this to a colleague. So yes, you can actually, if you wanted to do more in depth and really get hands-on, 
these are going to be, you know, obviously more time consuming, but, you know, you can basically get, you know, through most of these different areas and, and obviously they have quizzes and interactions and things like that. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Dr. Jin, I'm wondering if you have any experience with kind of how to, how, how most quickly to bring people up to speed with, with these tools, uh, particularly if you've taught this in the, in the course of your um, instruction? Um, sorry, we, we actually um, perceive the learning a little bit different. You know, we have the course structure with prerequisite of those things. So we do learn things or teach things a little bit different. Yeah, I, I don't think that's actually, you know, we are like a semester long for one topic, things like that. Probably not the best way, you know, to do here. Yeah. Um, do you, you do you ever leverage uh, the the Google uh, co collab notebooks, or is it something that you would consider? Um, I actually I never used this uh, before. Yeah, but I, it seems like a pretty convenient. Uh, you do not need to like explicitly do the pip install of things, so it can be a really good one for people to start with. Yeah, it seems like a really great way, uh, and I, I really appreciate Walter's expertise on this, because it seems like a great way to spin up things very quickly, uh, jump to the actual action of being able to, to uh, process the data rather than spending a lot of your time just doing the kind of sysadmin setup and setting your environmental variables and installing all the libraries and things like that, so it's great. All right, I'm gonna put, um, so yes, I think if, yeah, there's a lot of good stuff here actually. So I'm looking for, here we go. So yeah, for anyone, if you know, it looks like it, it's a pretty good, and that's a really good point Tony. So I'm just looking at this, you know, you can go through all these, you know, small courses, you know, pick the topics that you're, that you're interested in. Obviously, they're going to be more heavy on the, the neural nets and the, and the TensorFlow aspect of it. But I think there's, you know, definitely some basics around how to get started. And, you know, again, it seems pretty interactive, right? You have videos and things like that. So it's not just like dry documentation and text. So very good point. That's great. Right. I'm yep. also just dropping a link in the in the chat to um, some some Google slides that are meant to be kind of like a whiteboard for us. We This is a this is from yesterday and we can keep building on it. So if you, if any of you have, have things to add to these, you can regard them as kind of notes or a brainstorming place. If you'd like to add any links or other ideas, please feel free. All right, sounds good. So I think continuing on, uh, just to do a quick rundown of the tool itself. So again, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, I'll, I'll speak to just <clears throat> working with the cells. And I think they even have some of the instructions here within the documentation. So the way I structured this was actually using the, the usual templates. So I basically just appended, added an introduction. But the, if you start creating a new notebook or just look up Google as templates, it'll just give you this default stuff to help get started. And then, you know, again, I'll, I'll speak a little bit more about, you know, running the cells and things like that. And... If you, you know, there's there's tons of key, uh, keyboard shortcuts actually within uh, Jupyter and uh, or you know Python notebook and uh, you know. But again, if, if you're interested, there you know, again we can yeah you know, I can die I can share a bit of that if folks are interested. And so with that, I think one of the first things too is from time to time if you're not active, just it will disconnect because it you know it doesn't want to be engaged with the you know the the Jupyter night the Jupyter sorry, the Jupyter server the whole time. So if you're idle for a while and not working, you know, using it, it'll, it'll give you a heads up. So just hit connect and it'll reconnect. And then obviously it's like a Google doc, right? So if you're editing a read only, it'll, it'll flag it here on the, on the upper right. And then also, also usual, right? If you want to share this, if you're working this, it's going to assume that it's restricted, but if you want to share it, then you can go ahead and hit the share button. So with that, I think one of the first things was um, obviously navigating in cells. And so Cells are basically the way notebooks are organized. And so there are really two primary types. I know there's other ones that they do, but I think they, in general, again, you're either going to have code or you're going to have text. And so if you're uh, working in this, you know, the, right now I have not highlighted a cell, but, you know, you basically just click over one of these cells or double click on it and you're now in the cell. 
So maybe if everybody, if you have it up, you can practice that if you'd like. Um, just go ahead and, you know, you can always hit escape. You're out of the cell and then you double click. So I guess it's kind of like Excel, right? And here, you're actually in the cell and then you escape, right? And in this case, I think there was a question yesterday about um, markdown or our markdown. And so this actually is markdown. So there's a link to it in the, and I'll get to it below, but basically our, a markdown is a, is a nicer, friendlier version of, of HTML. And that's, that's actually what this is generating when you're, when you're hitting execute. And basically, I, I think it's pretty self-descriptive. So if you want headings, you're gonna use these pound marks, which you see here on the right-hand side. If you want links, I usually do this notation where, again, don't have to get, you know, in general, you're just gonna write text, but just say that you could have some links, right? And, in this case, I, you know, you, you just name it and you add the link at the bottom. That's just my notation, that my way of doing it. But this is pretty much, you can make lists, other things like that, but you don't have to get too fancy. And then when you're done, you can do, um, I usually do control enter. So if you hit control enter on the screen, I'm like, I'm not using the mouse. I'm gonna hit control enter, or sorry, in, in text, you might even be able to just click on the outside of it escape yeah or even escape i suppose but you can also if you'd like to do run you could just do run uh the selection so if you're in here you can also do the run i think text is a little bit different text you just have to do a run selection yeah, interesting okay well i guess text is text it doesn't it doesn't try to parse it so once you're done you're done so if you edit it let's just say you know test, you know, escape. so it just shows up. So it doesn't even execute. So you just, yeah, if you're editing text, just know that once you're, once you're done, you know, uh, editing, right, you just, you know, you press escape and it shows up. So, um, so we'll leave that alone. So that's how you edit the text. Um, and then, so I guess I'll pause for a moment. Any questions on the, the markdown editing text here? You can add cells if you'd like. I'm wondering, uh, this might just be my not knowing how Python works, but is there a place where you can see like what um, objects you have in your in in your environment? You could probably do. That's a good point. So something like uh, right, like an R, right, where you would have like the little like R student, like the the thing on the right. Um, not sure. There might be a plugin. I think. Um, that's a good point. Let me see if there's a, I don't know, Tony, are you aware of, do they have something like, a, do you have, the, are you I, aware of like a viewer or something on the, you know? I don't know. You're, you're kind of running the show on the collab. You have more, <laughs> a whole lot more experience than I do. So. We'll look into it at the break, Scott. If, if I find one, there might be a plug-in. Usually like, yeah, the collab, uh, documentation is really good. So if there is one, you know, I, you know, we'll, we'll look into it. Um, I guess the other way usually is you, you would just inspect the object, things like that, um, you know, or do a print, but yeah, that's a good point. Um, okay. Any other questions? All right. Continuing onwards. Is everyone set as far, I'm looking now at, uh, Eric and, and, uh, Dr. Jen and Taylor uh, in particular, and, and, and Bhaskar uh, as well. Uh, has everyone made a copy and kind of walking through it? So Scott is cool and no one has, has questions just about how to make the copy, right? Okay, cool. I see Eric gives a thumbs up um, and, and also Professor Jen. So, okay, cool. Okay. Awesome, sounds good. And. Uh, yeah, don't worry about breaking it. If at any point you, you need to, you can always just come back and just make another copy. Again, this is kind of the, the template that we have. And so, um, yeah, that's kind of, you know, the, the, the way these are intended to work. And then, uh, you know, going down, you know, the rest of these are really the text until, and, and you can follow along on the left hand side here. They're basically uh, the document or notebook is organized by sections. And then, uh, you know, there's, I'm just going to go through the text here, but you, again, you want to learn more about the, you know, using CoLab itself and, and other features and things like that. There's a documentation here. And then continuing on. So I think the one thing too, is if you're in a cell, 
you can go ahead and add a text. So the way you add a cell is you basically do, and then it would just show up below where you highlighted. And then, you know, because I highlighted text, it's gonna give me text, right? So, um, you know, it's just gonna give me an uh, example. So remember as we just, uh, yeah, so see it just shows up. So maybe if everybody wants to practice, just go ahead and, you know, I'm gonna, you know, and the way you would remove it is here in the upper right, you just hit delete. But, you know, let's just say we hit this, what is collaboratory cell. So you'll see that it's selected. And then, you know, we go ahead and just do and add text below. And then you can just start typing. And then, you know, um, section, and then it'll show up. So it's interactive in that sense. And then again, if, you, if you're done, you're gonna press escape. If you don't like it, you have it selected, you can delete it. And then also if, uh, if you wanna like move these cells around, that's what these arrows are for. So if I wanna move this cell below getting started, I would go ahead and hit down. And you see now it's below the getting started. For, so for any reason you can rearrange your cells, you can do that. Um, and so that's one easy way. I think probably where this comes in handy is if it doesn't, like if you want to sell above for some reason and you make a mistake, you can all, just know that you can always uh, move it up and down. And so this is, um, you know, continuing onwards. Um, so what they do, and, and I think this is a good lead in for the code cells. And so basically, as I mentioned, there's, you know, text cells and then there's code cells. And in this case, this is running Python. But in the case where we enable it to run R, it would run R. And so, you know, this is where if you highlight this cell, it's still text. So as you can see, right, this is, again, just if you want to do bold, you could do the, the double asterisk and then the heading is a double pound. And then if we go down here, we can see this is actually a code cell. So code cell looks a little different. So maybe if you guys are here and to get it started, go ahead and double click. So I'm gonna start from scratch here. So if I'm outside of this cell, Go ahead and double click on the code cell. And then you'll actually be able to edit the cell. And in this case, this is you know, the, the actual code. And then this is just using a, a very simple example, right? So we're just gonna do seconds in a day. Uh, we're gonna do some arithmetic, assign it to this variable, and then we're gonna print it out. So um, the one thing in Colab and, and Notebook is it kind of does a wrapper too. So sometimes um, like if you want to print stuff out, I usually do print just to be safe, but in this case, it's pretty simple, right? So you, you could just like insert the variable name and it'll print it out for you, but just a, a pretty small detail. But again, if you're in the cell, um, if you want to hit you know, control enter, it'll run it. I didn't use the mouse. So in this case, it, it, this is telling you that it's running and when it's spinning, it actually runs. And when it stops spinning, it comes back to this play then uh, then you know it's executed. Usually a trick I'll do uh, just to know is uh, I'll leave myself a little output. I, I typically want to see what I'm doing, right? So I'll do like a little print. And then, um, so say if there was no output here, I might just do, I, this is silly, right? But I'm just going to say done. And then I'm going to do that. And then it's going to hit. And then it's going to say done. But something like that, something silly, right? But, um, you know, again, this is, this is how you would edit. So if you're editing and if you're using the mouse, you could just hit run here. Does the same thing. And then done. So questions here on the code cell as far as, um, and again, you can create, if you're highlighting here, if you want to create a code cell, create another code cell. And then also the one thing too is uh, these are all in the same space. So as you're writing your code, uh, these variables are in memory. And so don't worry about, oh, do I have to worry? Yes, yeah, seconds in the day is still there for you to use. So if you want to go ahead and do, um, you know, seconds in the day plus one, you know, let's just do seconds. And feel free to, if you want to play around with it, you know, you just. So you, you we could see that now that the, uh, you know, we, we're still in memory, we're still good. And so all this stuff, when we're doing between the cells, you'll, you'll also see in the, and when we get to the classification piece, uh, we're gonna reuse a lot of the same variables. Um, we see in the chat that Scott mentioned uh, the, the syntax to load R. Um, that's, that's awesome. So Scott, what are you, are you um, doing something specific with, uh, are you trying to execute any sort of stats? 
using the, the R library there? Um, I was just starting to play with the ggplot, um, but the, the, the code to make it an R chunk instead of a Python chunk is this percent percent R. So that's all you got to do and then you can run R. Awesome. Yeah, and that's a great insight. That's a point. Yeah, the double uh, percent is what they call the that It's a bad name, but it's called a magic function within Jupyter. And what it does is it enables you for the rest of the cells following. Um, and I think we'll get like I'm just going to skip ahead, but I think I do it down here. When I do, yeah, you'll see like uh, it's not a double, but yeah, it's something like this where this is telling make all the plots inline for the you know after this cell. So yeah, that's just that's the that's the notation. And so, Walter, while we're stopped, I just have a quick question. Um, uh, do you have any experience using uh, Collab Pro? Uh, the, uh, the advantage, according to Google, is just faster execution, less likely to time out, uh, also more memory to run things. So do you, have you come across applications that almost like cross the threshold where you needed to use, uh, use that because you're crunching too, too much over too long period, too long. Yes, period. computer vision. If you're doing the the really big models, if you're doing all the training, especially when it's creating the the model files, um, yeah, it'll time out. If you're doing like you know, yeah. So that I think that's a good use case is um, you know, not not timing out. And then yeah, the the resourcing that you can that you can throw at it, um, you know, yeah, I think that would be the one. But yeah, if you're typically just doing a regular, you know, I think once you cross into like neural nets and you're doing especially computer vision, I think that's the best one. So yes. Okay, and just for everyone's reference, Collab Pro costs, this version doesn't. So mm -hmm. they give you they give you your first hit free and then you have to pay for the for the high level stuff. Yeah, and, and probably, you know, the argument could be made, right? It's almost like a return on investment because it's almost your downtime, right? You spend a bunch of time and you run it and then it, it times out in the middle then you just kind of lost the X hours or whatever. Yeah. But I think, you know, if you kind of pay, you get a payback in, in you know, in being able to, to upgrade to the pro, so. Cool. All right. Um, so continuing onwards, um, again, a little bit more, again, I guess they did this example for us already where again, the variable carries over and you're able to run, you know, the, the code. And again, you just hit run here. And then also one thing I'll highlight later on is if you're doing plots, it's pretty nice. You can actually just save the plot as an image. Uh, and that's how I was able to get the, on the on my Google slide, I was able to get that uh, confusion matrix. So you can always save the plot and, that, and that's really nice. Oh, and also if you're, um, there's a workaround in Google where, uh, or sorry, um, if you want to print, it's kind of clunky. Like you'll notice there's not a um, print here, but what you can do, and I found this out, you download the notebook and it'll actually, if you run everything, it'll save the output for you. You have to look it up, look, uh, load it up locally, and then you can export it like PDF or low tech or what you what have you, but it won't out of the box give you the option within notebook. Um, so that's the way to do it. Um, if you want to print. And um, and then here we get to the data science portion. So I think again, I'll just do a very quick run through again, uh, you know, and I'll pause for, for questions, but this is the, you know, creating of a randomized, you know, basically creating a, a data set of randomized points. And then we're going to go ahead and, you know, just go ahead and do a plot. So maybe starting at the beginning, it, you know, we import the NumPy package, which is for uh, numerical Python and numerical computing. It basically gives you the um, niceties of arrays and, and matrices and things like that. So it's a pretty powerful one. And then matplotlib is a, is a plotting library for um, Python. And then you, we just abbreviate it as PLT so we don't have to type you know, matplotlib every time. And then again, this is creation of, the, um, of a data set of you know, just randomized numbers using the, the NumPy random um, function. And then this is creating using matplotlib. We, we basically create you know, this visualization below, but basically you know, we're gonna do the X and the Y and then you know, fill in between. I think this is just some interpolation that they're able to, they, I think what they do is they probably connect between these points on the plot is what I think it's doing. And then you know, the syntax I think is, it's pretty procedural in that regard. It's like a recipe, right? So we're gonna say plot first, and then we're going to do all the treatments on it, right? So if we want to fill the gaps in the plot, if we want to add a title, and then finally, uh, we always do plot show, at least to, to be able to render it here. So if we want to do the output here, we would do a plot show. 
And I think this is also a really good example of once we get down later, um, we'll do like a density plot, but it's the same process where, you know, first we basically identify or clean or prepare the data so that we have it in, you know, in a variable. In this case, it's, you know, it's the X and the YS variable. So they basically do, um, you know, they're plotting to the, these two variables. So we have it ready. And then we send it into the plot function, kind of do our, you know, whatever else we'd like to do to the plot. A lot of times, like say, notice they didn't label the axis here, but, you know, you could do like a, plot dot, you know, axis label or X label or something like that. And you can label the axis. You can add, you know, all sorts of kind of neat and fun stuff. You can also add additional data sets if you like. You can add trend lines. You know, there's all sorts of stuff you could do. But this is, I think, a pretty clean and simple, just, you know, X and Y plot. And then, you know, putting a title and, and plotting it out to the, uh, to the notebook. Any questions here? I'll continue on. All right. So again, they give you links along the way. So if you're following along, you can always, you know, if you'd like to read a little bit more, they give you, it looks like they do a little bit more about, you know, cleaning and working with data. And then here we get to the machine learning parts of it. You know, again, I would say, um, you know, it looks like they, they, they reference the links below to the getting started to machine learning. And again, we talked to that, um, you know, we, we took a look at that, um, that coursework that Google has available. So again, you know, if you'd like to look at that, um, you know, again, this is the one that the full overview for collaboratory. And then this is the guide, this is what I was talking about, about um, uh, Markdown. So this is uh, actually an interactive uh, tutorial on Markdown. So if you want to brush up and, and learn more about the, the language we just talked about, but basically how to add any, annotate your text we can, we can, we can, and, and they have kind of examples here. And then again, this is so that you can practice. So um, yeah, you can edit all this stuff if, you, if you'd like to get, you know, more practice in Markdown. Um, again, a lot more fancier stuff you could do here. So, you, you know, they show you how to make lists. You can do, um, you know, look like quotes, things like that. You can show, you know, you can actually show code within these blocks. Um, you know, all sorts of stuff if you want to do notations. So, I guess maybe for uh, the, the fancier stuff, math, math notation, you could do that as well. They have that available within Markdown. You could do tables if you'd like. You know, you can get you're pretty fancy with some of this stuff. Again, plenty of links. Um, GitHub actually also do, the, do their readme's in Markdown. So um, it's pretty handy. It, it comes in handy in a lot of places. So it's not a, not a Google Colab thing per se. Um, and again, it just enables, and in the end, it just spits out HTML. So again, it's a pretty compatible, friendly format. So I'm going to close that out. And, um, you know, again, working with data, I think we talked about, or sorry, let's go back. Um, so importing libraries, installing dependencies. So I think we, there was a question about that. Um, let's see what they give us. So this looks like it, it's also a notebook. Um, so yeah, this tells you how to, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily speak to, you know, how like like say version control on modules and packages, but you basically if you want to run shell commands to do a package manager, you could use pip or app get. So I guess underneath the hood, just know that if you want to run shell commands, you just do a pound or an exclamation mark, pound mark, and then you can put the you know basically runs a, a Jupyter or Unix kernel underneath the hood. So you're you're free to do that. Also, one thing I'll point out is there's like a little drawer here where I think you can there this is the actual um I think this is, yeah. So this is actually, I guess to, not to confuse things, but you actually have within this little kernel you're running, you have your own file structure. So I, you know, or, or your own little workspace. So you can actually like, and I think they've preloaded some of this data. Uh, so they have like the MNIST data set, California housing as an example. And then I think this is how you're able to connect up like your Google Drive files and things like that. But you're able to, let's just say, have a little bit more flexibility if you want to, import export files, you have a little workspace within the, the notebook that you're in. So just FYI. And then again, if you want to put that away, you just hit, uh, you, you can exit out. So I'm going to, and then let's take a look. So yeah, if you want to upgrade uh, versions of a, you know, to a specific version of a package, you could do that. And then again, different ways to, you know, different packages you could work with, you're going to run with, through it in the shell. These are probably pretty common um, packages. 
Yep. So that's just a very brief tutorial on how you, if you want to import packages. And, and I guess the other note is that, um, so I guess I was right, Tony. So import a library that is not in collaboratory by default. So I think that's why I'm getting pandas and all the other stuff by default. Um, but otherwise, if you get an error, you would just do the town um, install, pip install. Um, I will say with Conda, you have to like install it. It's kind of a, I would say in Prolab, just use pip because you have to go and download it, unzip it. It's kind of, you know, a lot of horsing around. But um, so anyway. Where do you see the list of default libraries? Um, you could probably just search for it. They'll, they'll probably tell you up front. It, I'm, I'm guessing it's probably going to be very similar to the one Anaconda has, but I do not um, have it, though. We can look. Yeah, something like this. And you just give you a full list. So, so yeah, something like, I guess you could even find out, right? I guess it'll show you probably what you have on your instance currently. Okay, but, cool, cool. Um, Pretty much most of the common stuff, most of the usual stuff you would need. Um, yeah, so. All right, continue. And just in case, if, if uh, anyone wants to take a look what you get out of the box. So these are, uh, these packages are all, um, Sorry. So this is the list if you know of what you get. You don't have to worry about doing the install, but you know for the most part you'll have what you need here, uh, which is pretty nice, including uh, Scikit-Learn. So you don't have to worry. And the nice part about having this stuff pre-installed is some of these packages might be pretty large, so it actually saves you a lot of time. And um, so I guess it, it's kind of in a way like a way to encourage to use Colab and stay within Python. But again, you know there, there's there, you know it's open to other languages as well. Okay. Do you find the um, so on the on the far left hand side there, you got your code snippets. Do you mm -hmm. often start from those code snippets for some common operations? Oh, you mean um, you mean up above, like here? Uh, well, no, I'm talking actually. If you know, on you were pointing out the the file uh, repository sure. that that allows you a session specific files. And then just above it is is a list of code snippets. The next next icon up, in between find and replace, yeah. So, how 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 useful are these uh, code snippets as starting points for doing some of the operations that you might commonly do? There's stuff like opening files from Google Drive, open files yeah. from the file system. There you go. Um, output handling, pandas display, data frames, blah blah blah. Yeah. So, I just wonder how useful that you found this to be. Uh, it looks pretty useful because I I was I I have not dug around, but hey, these are pretty cool. So yeah, if you want to, I they look pretty good. Um, I yeah, if uh, you know yeah, if you want to open from local, if you want to do all this stuff, it's uh, yeah, you don't even have to look it up. You could just it, you know plug it right in. So. Yeah, I think that the uh, the handling of inputs and outputs is probably pretty. Uh, it it just kind of cuts to the chase there. You can, you know, learn how to save the data to your local file system to the file file system referenced here in the session to Google Drive. Um, you know, all of those. The, sometimes the inputs out outputs can be particularly frustrating when you're first starting out with different syntax. Uh, so, uh, you know. When you have your file structure set up, I've noticed that there is a way you can have different folders, right? And you might have similar files within different folders and use your folders to organize different versions of, of the files to maybe test different uh, input formats. And you can copy, you can then copy the path for those different folders as a way to distinguish those, those versions. So that's, that's something to bear in mind is to use the path as a way to kind of um, test different input formats and things like that. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, so yeah, I think uh, feel free to, yeah, it's a really good point, Tony. I, yeah, I, I know that, that, you know, so I think we we dug through it quite primarily like in code for Sacramento. <laughs> we, we were trying to hook up the, the mapping one and that's how I knew we had this like thing, but yeah, I am not, um, I didn't get a chance. I would usually just go in here and muck around, but this is actually, yeah, really useful. And yeah, there's ways to connect up to um, you know the the other uh, you know Google products 
Um, it looks like there's some linkages to Altair, which is another plotting library. Um, so yeah, visualization, there, there's kind of out of, the, out of the box, these are ready to go. So they even give you, there's the um, the cars data, big, big shout out to the cars data set, but it looks like it's here. And then they, you know, they give you an example code of how to do visualization. So again, um, and maybe we could, uh, yeah, as we progress, we can always come back to this if, if folks are interested at all. But yeah, these are little snippets to help get started. So yeah, thanks for pointing that out. This is really sure. Good. The the other thing while we're paused is uh, the uh, the terminal functions that you you may find the need for for that. And uh, that's something that's in the pro version. So I just wanted to know if you've come up against a wall where you really find you need the terminal, which is if you go down to the far left, left bottom corner, there's the option for terminal. Yeah, like right here. They put it yeah. in there as a kind of teaser. Uh, and I just wanted to know how in, in, in your practice, have you needed it? Have you wished for it? Uh, are, are you able to get around it um, using the code? It depends probably on how deep you need to go. I know this is probably mimic, mimicking the, um, if you're in regular Jupyter, you could have a Jupyter shell. I think that's what this is mimicking. Uh, my experience, you could basically script like within these cells, you could probably script enough to where like, I'll just give an example. Like if we have a new you know code block, I could just like literally just script my way through it. Something like that. You know, I could do, you know, so on and so forth, right? I could do yeah. like, you know, I can continue to, uh, you know, just keep on scripting my way around, you know, and so on and so forth, right? And so I think I, but that's on a limited case, but yeah, I think if you're doing, but on the other hand, I've seen pretty healthy scripts where like there are multiple statements where there's a lot of config that goes on. So one could do it um, unless usually there, but usually in Jupyter, you don't need to use the, the actual shell um, as much, but that's just me. I don't know, have you come across that, Tony? Um, you know, I guess it, it, the advantage of doing it through your through the script is that it's trackable, repeatable, and uh, and so you you definitely know kind of where you're going, but sometimes when you're just kind of wanting to do something quick and dirty, a terminal window can can mm -hmm. allow you to explore a lot a lot faster than writing the, the scripts to do the same thing. Okay. But there, I would imagine that there could be some brick walls where, um, uh, especially if you're trying to adapt something that it, someone has given to you in, in, a, in a command line for, and you're trying to then adapt it to a script, it might be a lot more work to do that than just kind of do it quickly in the command line. But maybe you can just do everything in script and it's, and it's all good to go. I'm just, I'm trying to probe the, the frontiers of this, like where it starts getting bogged down, either in terms of storage or resources, you know, what are those edge cases? Sure. So that when people do run into them, they know that, the, that there are pathways forward in terms of maybe paying for that pro version. And it sounds like, for instance, with, as you, as you indicated, computer vision, if you're going to be doing intense crunching of uh, uh, particularly in the training, I don't know if it applies to inferencing as well, but in the training, if you're going to be using this for that, you're going to need sustained high power, uh, long duration sort of sessions. And so you probably want to look at the pro version at that point or just deal with your frustrations. It's also probably that old adage too, right? That the you know compute power is a lot cheaper, right? In the cloud than staff time. So it's probably the time that you save and having to wait for it. So if you're having to, in yeah. some of these models, right, you have to keep retraining. So it's probably much cheaper to scale up and just pay for the pro. And then you'll yeah. get that time return because then you can just run, you know, more iterations, things like that, and, and just get done faster. So. But if you are trying to deal with a very large team of low power users, you know, like you want to bring them along, the Code for America is a great example, but you, you're, you know, being able to share and collaborate uh this is this is like a, an ideal scenario here it seems very powerful for that yep. and then if you want to get more in depth and and run some very large processes on huge data sets you could end up hitting hitting that brick wall agreed yeah i think that's definitely a good distinction so yeah thanks for pointing that out um so i think yeah if, uh, again just to recap if uh you know folks that want the code snippets just remember uh you know if you're here 
you can go ahead and pull out the drawer here. You got the table of contents for the notebook. You can also, I think this is a search through it. Yeah, you can do a find and replace if you'd like through it. Um, you know, kind of common stuff. Code snippets are here. Your local, um, you know, file directory. It looks like you can also link to files from your Google Drive, or you can mount your folders from your Google Drive. And command palette. Oh. Yeah, I guess there's other things you could do here. But yeah, I guess there's you know all sorts of stuff you could do here. And this is maybe probably a full listing of all the things you could do. So again, more of a UI based uh, you know feature. So um, yeah, okay. Getting down to I think we're okay. So we got to the first little example here. I think machine learning we've talked about you know kind of an overview, but also I think they link to more about. Um, so I think this maybe uh, would be of interest too, is a distinction too on their um, hardware and how they do it. So just gonna load this up real quick. Um, eh, not working. Oh, I guess they just, yeah, I guess they just do. Okay, they, they, if you wanna find more info here, if you can around, um, sorry, I, mean, I think it took me to, there we go. So yeah, if you just wanted to learn about GPUs, TPUs, uh, I think it's linked to down here. So you can find out more about, um, you know, using additional hardware, things like that. Um, and this is now, obviously this is geared more for the TensorFlow and neural nets part of it. And then I think these are additional links that we talked about earlier is, um, you know, again, how to use the, you know, Markdown Colab, working with data, connecting to their Google products. And then, um, you know, again, we look at some of these and especially the, um, the machine learning crash course and then machine learning examples. So these are probably gonna be the individual um, notebooks. So just to, uh, so it looks like this might be, let's take a look. So yeah, you can, um, you know, if you want to, we could have, I guess maybe we could have just as easily today, <laughs> maybe trying to go, go down a rabbit hole of an image classifier, not our trash level classifier. But if you'd like to poke around at this, this looks like they have, yeah, this looks like they're going to get ready to go here with uh, TensorFlow 2. So yeah, they're going to take, I think the flowers, which are probably like an iris data set. But yeah, if you want to go down the rabbit hole of Keras and TensorFlow, um, this is yeah, getting getting really hands on. And I think this is Tony why I didn't necessarily want to open this Pandora's, Pandora's box for one session because then we go go down the whole theory and and concepts of um, neural nets and performance and things like that. But um, this is basically I think probably trying to tell you classify what kind of flower it is based on the image. So here you have to choose the image. Um, and then TensorFlow Lite is basically a, uh, I think they're trying to get onto uh, like edge devices or like mobile devices. So they actually have a separate framework called TensorFlow Lite. Um, but yeah, they kind of go down and they really, yeah, I think they really kind of get started on this. And so, yeah, if you wanted to poke around, uh, you're more than, uh, you're more than free to do so. If I can get the chat back, let's do. Here we go. So this is the image classifier. So it's kind of a parallel, like we talked about this morning. If you want to poke around a computer vision and you want to do it in in Google Colab, this is probably a, a, again a, a introductory where all the code is done. And then um, I think they embed it within. So that apparently there's like a TensorFlow Hub here or tutorial. But I think what you do, would do is if you want to you know, you could run it in Colab and this would just spin up a new notebook for you. And that's how you would get it. So on any of these tutorials, you would basically, you could download the raw, but I wouldn't, this will require you to download it locally, which could be hairy with TensorFlow. So probably the easiest way is just open it in Colab. So we can see this is the process again for pulling down an entire notebook. But you can see, voila, here's the notebook. And then here it is, kind of the same steps. And then the same thing, if I want to do a run all kind of cut to the chase, things like that, um, you know, the same layout. But this is, again, the image classifier. That's that's really fantastic. Um, it's good to know that 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 is it's so easily connectable. One of the uh, one question I have, Walter, is if you have any experience with TPUs, 
So we, we understand what a GPU is being a graphical processing unit, the way that we're using these kind of like graphic adapters to now run these uh, very um, complex and, and uh, uh, you know, the, the GPU has kind of replaced the CPU in certain applications for, for adding more horsepower. Mm -hmm. TPUs though, the tens a tensor processing unit, um, it's fairly new still and it's, it's a Google invention. Have you had much experience using those, particularly for TensorFlow pro, uh, projects? I have not, though, probably because it's, I, I, my understanding is that I think they developed, they're Google developing their own chips. And so these are going to be the actual TensorFlow chips that they run. So, I mean, theoretically, it should be faster and, and optimized, right? So it's optimized to run TensorFlow. So you may get that performance versus obviously GPUs are just gonna connect up to whatever they have on their servers. So that's probably, you know, and it's really just the speed and performance, right? Yeah. Um, so you may wanna do, yeah, if, if you're curious, probably do some sort of profiling or even there's a, I learned about a function called time it for Jupiter. <laughs> you could just time something for that one cell. Uh -huh. So it's the uh, yeah, Jupiter time it. It's, a, it's another magic function really. So built in mag what they call magic functions. <laughs> So yeah, it's really a bad name, magic function. Like, what is that? But you could do, yeah. So these are like the typical one line magics, uh, just really bad. But yeah, you have like these other ones and I think you just have like kind of, yeah. So you could do like a, you know, you can have these little like functions to, to run within a cell. Um, but this is kind of what that was, you know, what we were referring to in like running R. Mm -hmm. But you probably, I would say, probably time it and maybe even do some sort of profiling um, as far as performance goes. But, you know, that, that's kind of my understanding of it. Have you heard of what NVIDIA is doing with their cards? The yeah, deep learning I, super sampling because they have tensor cores in there now that are really good at matrix calculations? Yes. And they actually, I've seen, um, they've actually come to, not to code for Sacramento, but there's another meetup that I go to and they've actually had engineers come in and yeah, they also completely train their hardware and um, they actually also build plenty of uh, data science examples that they publish. And so they, and obviously they're going to optimize around the hardware. So I think um, I, they might even be on GitHub. But yeah, like if you, yeah, they like really optimized out their stuff. Um, you know, again, some pretty, uh, you know, I think they even break it up by category, but yeah, you can go through and they have a, you know, they open source a lot of their stuff, but yes, um, their hardware is also starting to optimize around, um, you know, machine learning and especially computer vision. And then also they're getting into uh, autonomous vehicles. So they're also doing a lot of things around, um, you know, sensing and things like that. So that those are, yeah, some areas that they're pursuing. Yeah, they have the kind of uh, the embedded hardware model, um, placing those those uh, GPUs within the the actual vehicles for in that example. But they also sell these uh, workstations that used to be ex extremely expensive. They're still super expensive, but they have one workstation, as I recall, that they that has like multiple GPUs in it, um, and it's uh, extremely powerful for something like thirty thousand dollars. And that sounds like a lot of money, of course, but the horsepower that you get out of it is just it's 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 a it's a supercomputer. Yeah, it's so, a monster. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's just an amazing machine. And um, and those are optimized, of course, to be able to run these um, these artificial intelligence processes. There's actually speaking of which, there's a viral clip of the CEO. He goes up in front of these conferences. I think it's a Jensen Wong. He's always uh, his his adage is that the more you buy, the more you save. <laughs> he repeats it like he just that there's a meme around about it. It's pretty funny. Um, so yeah. All right, so yeah, there's definitely, yeah, NVIDIA has like, they open source some of their stuff and obviously they're gonna try to get, you know, they did like folks to use their hardware. Um, so yeah, that's also um, another option and things that are that are going. So, and then speaking of which, there's looks like there's some NLP tutorials. Again, don't wanna get too sidetracked here, but um, I think this one might link to, yeah, it looks like there's different examples here of how to do, um, you know, they have some different examples of 
for uh, article classifier, high classified articles. But you know, again, I'll let you guys look through this on your own. But um, you know, needless to say, this is you know they kind of go through the use case and how to do, and it looks like this is um, vectorization of words, things like that. But you know, kind of let you guys look through that. But there's a module here for uh, um, NLP for text. All right. So that was a bit more on image classifier. And again, ooh, text classification. So again, just gonna spend a little bit, a couple of minutes here, but I like this one. Again, this one is using the movie review data set, pretty classical data science stuff, but they're just gonna, I think I know what they're doing here. They're gonna take movie reviews based on text and try to classify what they are. And then again, they give you some context around, you know, what the data set is. So it's IMDB data sets. Um, again, you, you'd have to download this as a, uh, Colab notebook to run it, but you know, again, you can see what the code is. Um, so Walter, we have about five minutes left. Just, uh, yeah. just sure. You know. um, and then again, this is just some pretty, you know, this is just looking at the data set, you know, doing some previewing, and then this is actually developing the model. And it looks like they are using, it looks like they're using TensorFlow, yeah, and Keras to do this. But um, anyway. Let you guys have, just again there's a there's an example here with text classification um and then i think well right in time i think this gets us to the start of the actual trash classifier i think we had a really good overview here of the tool the what's behind the scenes um all the major features all the examples resources so feel free to you know again i think you guys have a hopefully a pretty good start on taking a look and knowing where to look and then I think leading up and after the break, I think what we'll do is we'll just go through this code. And again, I'm happy to, to really break this down. And you know, again, just a preview, we basically do some setup code here and then we get right into the plotting that I talked about. So I'll talk a little bit more about the trash level data set. Again, this was the in-downs data set that I, was, that I mentioned earlier. And then again, how to set up what we call a correlation map, but we can also maybe brainstorm different ways to plot the data if we'd like. Maybe we could do a comparison of the actual data set from the open data portal, maybe brainstorm some ideas. And then um, this is the actual code then to uh, prepare our data for the train and test. And um, so I'll, again, I'll, I'll go through this a little bit more, but um, again, we'll leave this for the afternoon. So, um, you know, we'll spend time here. And then I'm thinking that Maybe this is our deliverable, is our knowledge sharing, is making sure that everybody has a good, you know, we'll, we'll do some tweaks to this code, but I think we'll probably have to spend a little bit of time walking everybody through, but I think that would be, hopefully everyone would get something out of that, of like, okay, this is actually how you do it, and, and, and you know, walk everybody through it, and, and just make sure we're, we're good, and then we'll tweak as we go, and then that way also then afterwards you can hopefully take it, reference some of the materials, and maybe the machine learning crash course, and tweak the code a little bit, right? Because this all runs. So actually, let's just do a run all. So if you want to, right now, if you want to do a run all here, so if you go to runtime, you can actually just run all the code now. So you'll see that I, you know, right now the, the code's not running. So I just do a run all. So this is actually just real time. This is starting to run all the cells. And I think this is, yeah, this is going, going. That one ran, this one ran. So it should run relatively quickly because it's not a very big data set by modern, I guess, you know, most measures, but you know, what you should see is basically this decision matrix at the end. And then it, it has stopped running because it's, you know, now on play, but this is how you would do it is if you copy it, you want to tweak it, um, you know, you would just go ahead and do a run all and you can tweak and, and um, you know, if there's errors, it'll let you know, but that's, um, that's kind of the sneak peek of the afternoon. That's great, Walter. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. So I think with that, we're right at noon. I think, right? And uh, you know, at the after the break, we'll we'll dive in, take a look at City of LA data, and then we'll, you know, we'll go through this a little bit of code and and set up and do our first plot. I think that's our that's our to do. Any? I guess I'll pause. Any questions before we? I guess we will break, right? But any questions or feedback? Okay, sounds good. Um, I got around, but thank you. This is I'm. This is really exciting. Oh yeah, no problem. You know, and and you know, uh, I hope. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think just give you enough enough for people to really get started, get your feet wet. 
um, you know, just we'll just go line by line and, and go through these modules. And I think there's a lot of information, even with these little packages, right? Like, how do we do plots and how do we look at a data set? And, you know, how do you preview and look at rows and columns and things like that? So we'll dive in, um, you know, after the break. This is great. Thanks, Walter. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We look forward to seeing you at one o'clock after your lunch. All right. Enjoy yourselves. Stretch yep. your legs. Thanks, everyone. See ya. Great. Well, thank you for entertaining my, my questions while we're waiting for people to gather. Yeah, thank you. Hey, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you had a good lunch. Thanks, Scott. See your message there. We'll uh, maybe see you at, uh, at two then. Um, but uh, thanks for for uh, for continuing to participate and help us out, contribute so so uh, helpfully. How was your lunch, Walter? Was there a good cook there in the house? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> We're all, we've been working home from home for about a year now, so adjusting as usual. So yeah, yeah. yeah, it's all remote. All remote, yeah. I had soba, which was nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's pretty weird going in to work for the lab specifically, and you're the only person in the building. It's like relaxing with the rain. And you like you want to take a nap somewhere because all the offices are empty. Does it feel a bit post-apocalyptic? I've had like glimpses of thinking like, this is what it would feel like if I were like the last man on earth or something. Yeah. It's a little bit of like, oh, I'm going to file this away. And then like, this, there's no one here to even read this. Like, why am I here? Yeah. So you're actually in the building, Eric? Or in a building? I was yesterday. That's why the whole setup is different and everything. Uh, just for like lab work for processing E. coli. Sure. Okay. All right. Can we uh, ease into it then? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, very cool. Um, so I'm going to share the screen. You might hear a little bit of background noise from me. I'm trying to monitor another meeting on it on my other monitor. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to show what this looks like if you're actually. So this is in a free version. So as Tony pointed out, um, basically, yeah, if you're if you're uh, not on pro then it'll disconnect like this so uh, what you would do is you see this and you may see this after if you step away from lunch and you know you just do reconnect and then it'll show here it's reconnecting it's initializing and then once you see this kind of the, the metrics here it's pretty much reinitiated so that's just fyi that you know this is what you get kind of on the free version um but not a big deal your all your work is still here also um upper on the on the on the toolbar here um basically uh you know if you if you want you probably want to save from time to time so you know you just hit save and then it's saving and it just saves like a google doc so again don't worry about losing your work or anything like that um and then you know just as a precaution from time to time when i'm really done like say between work sessions i'll actually just pull down the entire notebook so that's always a good practice too just in case you know you can Kind of version control it's binary um in addition i also use git on my local files but um again so just some kind of general practices for saving the work um so with that um and the the version control the the diffing on the versions is uh pretty cool too so if you wanted to kind of see changes over time you can just check it out by clicking on the the same way you would with a Google Doc or anything else, you can click on the all changes saved and get to a diff view. Mm. So actually has some GitHub integrations from within Google Colab. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, very cool. Okay, I did not know that. That's very cool. Um, okay, well, um, in that case, yes. Um, and I also, uh, we'll take a look at psychic learning a little bit, but I think for now, I think what we talked about basically, um, you know, this is the initial setup like we talked in this morning, right? That there's preloaded libraries in, um, you know, Google Colab. And so, you know, basically the four really that, you know, and I grouped them together, which you see on the screen. So Pandas is a data analysis library, which I think we can look at really quickly. Same thing with NumPy. These are really bread and butter. If you're going to do a, not even data science, but just sort of any work with data and you want to import primarily, these two will give you the ability to load data as a data, what they call a data frame. And then that will enable you to slice and dice and index and all that fun stuff. And then matplotlib is pretty much a um, one of the main plotting libraries for Python. And um, again, we can look at that. So maybe we could just do a, you know, just looking at the functionality. And again, these will be kind of traits that you want to look at when you're looking at different packages, whether it be MATLAB or, um, uh, you know, Python or R, or even MATLAB. You know, you, you, you probably want to look for these features as far as when it comes to data analysis and plotting and visualization. These are really bread and butter even before you get into machine learning. And I think hopefully everyone will take with you after this, uh, this workshop. Um, and then Seaborn, we'll also look at that. Um, it, it's kind of like the Cadillac, of, if you will, of plotting. It's kind of rides on top of, if uh, matplotlib is your Chevy, uh, Seaborn is your Cadillac. It's got the power steering, it's got the nice stuff. Uh, I'll, I'll show you guys that as well. Also the code is really, um, it's a little higher level. You do some, you do some trade-offs, the syntax is easier, but it's a little bit less uh, interpretable. Let's put it that way. If you wanna really look underneath the hood, um, it kind of abstracts away the details, but at your own risk, right? So I'll, I'll kind of point that out. And then the last one here is obviously the scikit-learn library, which um, you know, we took a peek at yesterday, but you know, I'll go through um, you know, kind of these different models that we bring in. Uh, again, it's pretty nice in that you you bring in what you need. So um, I'll get into what these you know what each one of these mean basically, and they, these help us do the train and test model, and then we'll get into actually you know reading the the data frame or reading the data. So with that, um, I'll go ahead and pull up the pandas library first. Um, so I'm going to stick this in the chat. Um, so basically, this is the uh, this is the um pandas library and sorry i'm queuing up the chat window here for some reason it does not like to show up interesting okay well um if you yeah if you just want to look up um i can't huh, interesting there we go there you go so there it is uh basically so you could go ahead and follow along. There's actually a O'Reilly book, which really, if you really want to learn about just data analysis and pandas, um, it's available for O'Reilly. And then they have some pretty robust um, tutorials. I'd say probably the getting started is probably the, because um, we don't have to worry about installing, right? It's, it's on Google Colab for us, but um, you know, the getting started is really good. I actually, I've actually referenced this when I've tried to, you know, when I've taught parts of this at work, but basically the getting started tutorials are, um, really useful. Um, basically, uh, you know, what kind of data can you handle? How do I read, write data? So this is, you know, for this example, we're going to read from, uh, you know, from the actual open data portal. Um, but, you know, again, there's, uh, you know, different variations, how to create plots. Uh, you know, we'll, again, we'll get to this shortly. Um, I think some of this other stuff like summary statistics is probably pretty useful. I think this one has some visualizations in there. It'll actually even so Pandas actually has um, a regex. You can actually, it'll support regexes. So if you want to manipulate text, um, do it on the fly. Of course, it's not a full featured like NLP library or anything by any means, but um, you can do on the fly. Like if you're trying to strip white space, all that good stuff, it's got all the, the nice functions there to, to munge data. So if like for Eric, if you're, if you're just trying to bring in like data and just munge it. Um, another resource I'll share with you is I really like this one. It is a full cookbook of um, all this regular like machine learning. And this is primarily Python, but you know, it's got all this stuff like, like little recipes, um, especially when you get down here for, and this is mostly machine learning, but you know, there's a lot of stuff for just basic Python. So this is all like little recipes of Python. 
kind of similar to what we looked at in the Google Colab um, this morning. So let me stick this also there for you. So he's, uh, I think he works, I think with uh, Wikipedia or some organization, but um, again, I, I, I turn to this one because I find it really useful. So there you go. And um, so, so basically you can go in here and then I'm just gonna show an example. So say, yeah, if you wanted to clean some text that you found within your data sets, uh, he just gives you, in this case, it looks like he does use the NLTK, uh, you know, library to do so, but basically it just, you know, hopefully the syntax is somewhat interpretable, right? We're just gonna bring in some text, import the library, and then what we, they call tokenize. So basically take this piece of text and just cut up, cut it all up into words, right? That way you can have bag of words and do whatever you need to do. Mm -hmm. And that's basically what they're doing here is import the library, run a loop, and then return this uh, array or, you know, this basically this container full of just the words. And I think this is breaking it up by sentence as well. So I think what the library is doing is it picks up on the com or on the period here, and then it'll actually break each one of these up. In a, so you'll notice the brackets here, so it's actually breaking up the words by sentence so that you have each one as a separate item within your, like your list or your array that you get back. So just again, illustrative purposes, um, a lot going on here, but I'll let you kind of go through. And, and again, the, the, I have a feeling these were actually Jupyter notebooks that he took it from, which is why the look and feel, you'll see the cell. So again, speaks more to, um, you know, Jupyter be, making it easier to share work and things like that. but. Um, there's some other things here around like how to work with you know data frames and arrays and so on and so forth and then yeah data wrangling another fun topic another one that's near and dear to our hearts but um you know a lot of this stuff like how to work with categorical variables or how to you know load excel spreadsheets or different formats or how do i um do pivot tables so all regular expressions right so what i was saying is um you know you, we could do an example so again this is um you there's the regex library is called re you could import it and then again this is just a piece of text and then you know different little matches that you could do with regex right there it basically you put it in these uh, quotes and then it'll support regex syntax so that's kind of out of the box uh with pandas pause for any questions so far okay all right feel free to you know call out if you have if you have any questions so so that said, um, wanted to pull up the summary statistics that I think has some visualizations here. So this is typically, and you'll see this in our notebook, right? So right off the top, we're just gonna import the pandas library, right? Very typical code, right? Whether you're writing C or Java or what have you, we're just bringing in this external library and, and in Google Colab, it is pre-written for us. And then in this case, um, you know, we represent pandas is just PD. So we don't have to keep writing pandas. You can, if you want. Um, and typically they follow the same convention. Plant pandas is usually PD, um, matplotlib is usually PLT, so on and so forth, just makes life easier. And then after that, then um, these are really the first two statements, right? So pd.readcsv, right? Hopefully that's interpretable. And then in this case, um, for this example, you're it's assuming you're reading from your local drive, but in our example, we're gonna read from the open data portal. There's, a, there's an API or link that we pull from. So read CSV will accept either a path or a URL. It just knows that. And so again, um, hopefully that's straightforward. And then uh, if you just do head dot head, which is show the first five rows, um, you'll notice that it's index on zero. That's the convention that pandas follow. So if you ever want to use your index, but typically just think of this as the uh, table, you know, of rows and columns. And this data set um, consists of basically the survivors and non-survivors of the infamous Titanic data set. So it's a pretty well-known data set. They always reference it because it's got categorical variables and they can, you know, sort and filter on it. So it's always a fun one to look at. So if you go to like any statistics or machine learning course, a lot of times they'll reference this or iris or cars or things like that. And so this is, you know, the premise of the data set. And you'll see these, you know, these ellipses are basically that's got more than just the in this case, it's got 12 columns, right? So this is pretty typical output for a data set or a data frame is that um, you basically, it'll tell you, right? You have five rows by 12 columns. And so this is a, a very handy way of previewing the data set. And we'll actually see this code within the uh, notebook when we step through it. But, you know, again, this is just to get started, you know, import, read and display. 
And then summary statistics. So again, I think I like these examples because there's nice little visualizations like this where you could see like, okay, what am I actually doing? Let's see. So in this case, it's just aggregate so what we call an aggregation. So you're just gonna you know, do a summary or a min max just down one column highlighted in the yellow. And then in return, it gives you one value. So if you're taking an average, right? If I wanna average five values, it's gonna give me one number back, right? So that's what this illustration is trying to um, you know, show. And then also the way pandas works is usually um, if you're aggregating, it's gonna go down rows and columns. And then otherwise the power of it is that you typically do not have to loop. So one thing is I think, um, I know when I first got started, if you want to say, perform what they call row operations, right? Say if I wanted to do a, an average or some sort of operation down each row, probably one way if you just didn't know about pandas or, or, or the way to do things in, in, with data frames, you would just try to loop through each one, right? For I and whatever. Yeah. But pandas allows you to actually uh, what they call broadcast or actually just calculate the same operation on every single cell or row that you designate. So that's really the power. And we'll see that within these examples. So commonly you'll see like DF, like data frame dot or, um, you know, a particular column dot because you're just going to call this function and maybe it, the code is here. Yeah. So this is it. Yeah. This is what I was thinking. Is. So here they just basically, okay. So they've called the data set Titanic, right? So the convention, if you go up here, the data set's called Titanic, right? We create the data set, right? This table is now called Titanic. We're looking at the head here. And then what this notation means um, in the brackets is basically, well, I just want the age column. So, you know, go to the Titanic data set, you know, pick out the age, right? And just give me the mean down this column. And this seems like a really trivial example, but you can imagine like that trash data set we have, that's 30,000 rows, right? Or if you pull in, like pandas will let you, Python will let you pull in. If you want a 500 megabytes of data, not unheard of, you can pull it in and it'll actually, you know, the power is then the way it scales is that when you do these uh, broadcasting and row operations, it still operates pretty quickly, even if it's hundreds of megabytes of data. Mm -hmm. So again, this is just a trivial example to show you, you know, syntax, how, how it gets around. Um, but you can get much more sophisticated than this. You can, you know, you can basically like almost like slice down a column and then by a row, you can do, uh, you can chain operations together. Like you could say, okay, I want multiple rows, multiple or multiple columns, multiple rows. And then I want you to perform operations and you can actually start building your own data set again. Like say, if I wanted min, max, mean, all that stuff, you could create another table by just chaining these operations together. So just FYI, that those, these are more the kind of the more powerful features of pandas. And then this is getting down. I think this is where um, I was illustrating where you could get a little bit more sophisticated, right? What if you wanted more than one operation, right? You don't want to keep writing this code forever. I mean, you don't want to keep, okay, you could go one by one, but this allows you to say, okay, well, I just want to do basically in a way like a pivot table. If I want to do the median of these two rows separately, right? If I wanted to do the median of age and a median value of fair, I'm going to feed it this, what they call a tuple or this kind of pair of values or however many you'd like, right? You could call three or four or five, and then I'm going to call the median function on it. And then it's going to return me again, this shape being, you know, they're going to say the age, right? So we could take the column name and then we're going to take the fair column name, put it over here. And then the pink is the return value. So we see that, okay, we took the average of these five rows and in each one, each column has its own value. So again, these are illustrative examples, you know, visually so that you can see what's going on, but you can see very quickly how you could basically transform, transpose, slice it. You can move this thing around and you can join. Join is a really common one. And I think they get to this a little bit further down and um, describe again, very similarly is just, you can calculate summary statistics. You could call any column and just do dot describe or dot mean or dot median it'll actually calculate that value down that column for you. So again, these are very easy ways to look at your data visually. I mean, it's not going to generate these plots, you know, this thing for you per se, but you can easily just look down a column and look at values pretty quickly. And um, Did we lose Walter? Hey, Walter. Oh no. 
Everybody, uh, Eric, you're still there, right? Yep. He's frozen. Hey, Taylor. He's still with us. Yang and Bhaskar. Scott, I know, is doing other things. Let me... So, Eric, do you, do you really love regex? Oh, yeah, because they asked us to archive everything on the Waterboards websites. Yeah. And it's just like, that's a lot of documents. So I was able to use regex and pandas to just write a program in Python to do it for me. Why did you have to scrape from there instead of just going to the back end? Uh, Not like you didn't have access to it. I didn't ask too many questions, <laughs> but it, it was apparently one of those things where like, it, there was like a regulatory deadlines of like when things had to be up for accessibility reasons. And it was yeah. kind of like, well, it, it would be nice to have backups of all this stuff, but we may not have time to do that. So if we want to make sure we have it available, we need to do it. Yeah. Okay. If you went through the front door the way you did though, and kind of scrape from the from that front end side, then don't you run the risk of missing anything that's not explicitly linked, you know, but might have its own individual pages that that are not in the menu or referenced by other links? I mean, it was kind of like a quick and dirty anyways approach for everyone because there were so many documents it was like we may not be able to get them all in time oh, okay so i just yeah it was funny too i learned that like the it folks who handle this may not be consistent in their guidelines about how they format things and tag things so i had to handle like three different cases for like oh that's that's what you call that okay yeah right 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 and so regex was your friend oh yes it was so nice it was so fun to learn too and you were using a python based uh, kind of strategy there? Okay. Yeah. It was, uh, cause like part of my interest is, you know, game design. So I did, uh, I designed like a tabletop RPG and I have a D and D world. So being able to work with strings and text to generate like story snippets or environmental oh. descriptions or like people and their lives really useful to me. So when I discovered that it was like, Ooh, that's great. Well, I don't know exactly where he was going with that sentence. Here he is. So I, I got my I got my hotspot broken back out. So I was ready to go. So just in case, I got I got it up. It's 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 running. I got it. I got it. Uh, you know, Andy. But just in case, so we're back. Sorry about that. No problem. Yeah, the router had to restart. So yeah. I'm, uh, okay. Let me. So let me. Sorry. Um. So I was on um, data frame operations. So let me share the screen. All right. Can everyone see this? Uh, can everyone see where we left off the uh, the operations here? Yeah. Okay. So I think again, just wanted to go over the syntax here. Um, you'll this will be familiar in um, you know within the actual uh, you know. The, the example that we have. And so the convention typically is just think of it like this is, you know, you're typically going to import a data frame, what we call it, or basically you could think of it as a table. And then you're going to do column and row operations. And a lot of it is either chaining or calling things out together. And um, again, summary statistics, pretty common stuff. Um, so you can look it down, you know, for numeric data. And then you could do the same thing like unique or things like that. Um, those are pretty helpful. And then um, again, this is what I mean. You can get pretty fancy with this sort of stuff. You can like break it into, you know, you can, like I was saying, you can select the column and then kind of cut sideways on a row and then put these in the different little separate tables and then bring them back together. So again, don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but you could do basically, this is what they call group by. So I want these two columns, sex and age. And then I want to do a group by. So this is going to sort based on male and female, because in this case, it looks like one is, you know, this looks like it's going to be the 
sex column and then it's going to organize by the unique values male and female so here that's where you have these two separate little tables and don't worry pandas does it it keeps it straight for you you don't have to actually manage this like you just put this one statement and what it does is it knows okay uh, it's going to do the you know identification and then it's going to split it and then it's going to bring it back together you know for you and this is all done behind the scenes with the library but basically it breaks it up into two you know little subsets now and then it's gonna you say okay now i want the mean right and then i i, I assume this is going to be the age and then so you see this in the yellow is age and then it goes ahead and you know brings over the age name you know column you sh you're going to have these row names as well you know for the unique, unique values male and female and then you're going to get the age which is the average of these two columns but again i think this speaks to you can do everything within one statement that's more or less interpretable and behind the scenes it's taking care of this work for you because otherwise if you're doing it like in sql well you know you you know you're gonna have to break this up right you have to do a, a where and then you have to filter you know you have to assign it so on and so forth so this again uh, makes it rel relatively easier to follow and also for speed is relatively quick because you're not doing a loop and so that there it again speaks to the power of matrices and vectorization so basically behind the scenes it's also doing um vector operations or matrix operations it's not doing the traversing which again across a really large data set um, makes a big difference so that's why it's important to follow these conventions is that um, speed performance and uh, interpretability and um it strikes me walter that as far as like dealing with arrays it it's definitely um an, an improvement over a four i you know yep. statement but it 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 is it it just seems like an uh, a slightly more abstracted SQL statement, right? Uh, the advantage being that the SQL is going to be running on tables. This can be run on loosely bound kind of spreadsheets, right? Exactly, and so correct. And so what you could do is basically you could load in, and we'll go through this in the code. But you can load in multiple files, and you can you basically if you keep assigning them. You keep assigning one data set to the next to the next to the next to a variable and you could then yeah you could join and do multiple operations and then uh actually yeah the looping is a good point because you'll typically see that in stack overflow someone will say oh i want to traverse this table and then you know they show a row you know show a loop and then someone will say oh have you looked at these kind of functions and then um yeah it's just one of the I guess enhancements that they made with these libraries is to you know do row and vector or vector and matrix operations and then yeah it makes it much faster and then also just to break again this is i think what i was trying to describe is they break it down by statement so you're, again you're, you're taking this entire data set you're doing a group by based on male female and then you're doing another one you know this is the age this is the second column that you're calling in you're going to call mean and again this is you know for male or whichever one it is right male or female and then you're bringing it all back together so that's kind of what it how it's working behind the scenes I love the interpretability there. That's that's really mm -hmm. great. And um, again, a little bit fancier stuff. Again, I think you guys, I'll let you guys read through. But again, if you want to do counts, you can. Right? These are just different illustrations of how you can um, look through. So again, I'll um, you know these are going to be pretty important pieces because we'll be um, you know this is just the way of working with a table once you bring it in. And then once you feel comfortable, then you know we're able to then. This is part of um, the same way you can do these kind of aggregations. You, this is what you're going to be using to do data cleaning, right? So if you want to drop nulls, if you want to normalize data, it basically operates in this fashion. So this is kind of the the way to approach it. This is the framework that they provide. And then when we talk about or prepare the data for training and test, uh, we're going to be using the, the the function from Pandas. So just FYI. I wonder if we could just pause for a second. I want I want to see um, Professor Jin if if you you know what's your reaction to seeing these types of of abstracted languages uh, that that help you to kind of see the operations that might can more conventionally be done via things like either either as as Walter points out the you know doing arrays and and parsing and and splitting uh, that way or um, or using SQL against tables. Do you does it rub you the right way or rub you the wrong way? It's kind of almost like a feeling statement. I think you can use whatever way you feel comfortable to do, which one, whichever more convenient. Uh, 
<laughs> so it depends on your skills and uh, you know what are preference and doesn't matter which one. But this one actually quite convenient to do data manipulation within the um, like a Jupyter notebook. Uh, you also can do things offline. Yeah. Are we going to eventually lead into the, uh, like a, yesterday, uh, there were presentation about the image, we can do training, those things, do we eventually dig into that kind of like a code uh, program today? Do we have a chance for that? Sure, I think how's this is we, I think once we get through it, I think we had looked at that initial, uh, the computer vision template that Google provided, maybe we could do a walk through there. Um, yeah, how does that sound? Yeah, I know it, it probably not uh, like a time-wise, not possible to run it, but at least uh, uh, is that possible to go through the, the code or the, uh, the flow? Sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, no problem. We could do that. I'd be happy to do that. Um, okay. So gonna close this out. And um, so again, I think you can look through the tutorials here. Uh, Pandas is a package and it's an official under the getting started tutorial. So again, um, you can look at, and again, combined data. This is the one where you do the join. So again, just to check out, check it out really quickly. But I think this is the, you know, this is the example, you know, of, of you working with more than one data set. So um, I would just want to show the graphic of how to combine. So this is, again, you can either do what they call a concatenation, which is a vertical join of data, or you could do the horizontal, which is the more conventional, like the SQL join. Let me see if there, yeah, there we go. Something like this where, yeah, you're joining on a particular key or column. And this is used, I think, with the merge function. So they're gonna show you setting this up. But yeah, this is basically, this is the statement right here. So pandas.merge. So think of it as join, you know, usually it's always left and right. So think of it as like usual SQL, right? You're gonna join your air quality on the left, station coordinates on the right, and then they're gonna join on, well, it looks like a left inner, you know, left join and then they're going to do, you know, join it on location. So again, hopefully pretty interpretable um, syntax. And then again, I think it feels familiar in that it, it, it basically has that relational um, feeling to it, right? It, it's really built on, okay, relational data joining. And also the neat thing I found was um, the one thing you could almost, so one thing I found sometimes is that like when we do project IDs at work, they're never named the same way. It's either ID, project ID, whatever. So what I found, but I know that their project ID, it'll actually let you do like a left key and a right key. You don't have to rename or anything, which is pretty neat. So merge will actually let you do that. It'll super flexible. You, you pick left table, right table. And if you want, you can even join on different keys as long as you know what you're doing, right? If, they're, if they don't match, they're not gonna match, but it'll allow you to do that. And it doesn't force you to just join on one key. So anyway, just FYI. And I'm pretty sure too, I think you could probably feed it more than one too. You could feed it, say I, do, well, I wanna join on location and something else. I think it'll let you do that as well. So again, it's pretty flexible in the way it works of uh, joining tables together. So just wanna highlight that. Um, we'll come back to this. This is scikit-learn. I think right now I just wanna go through the libraries real quick because I think it'll make more sense to you. Um, so pandas is the one for data analysis. I'm just gonna, really look at NumPy really quickly. Not gonna, I know we're short and we're gonna be, you know, we're kind of crunched for time, but this is the one for um, numeric, what they call numerical computing. So this one gives you all the stuff with like matrices and other things like that. So as described, um, yeah, they give you basically matrices and arrays, which, is, which are called NumPy arrays. They give you all the linear algebra stuff you'd like typically, um, like with MATLAB. So they give you the ability to do um, transforms, um, you know, all the stuff you would do with matrices. And then um, again, part of it is that a lot of these libraries are gonna, and Python, a lot of parts of Python and libraries are built on C, so speed is pretty good. And then again, it, it the, the main thing is that works basically on vectorization of matrices. So um, speed and performance are gonna, be, are, are gonna be really good. And then Pandas is built on this, so you know, because we went over the, the pandas concepts. Again, think of it as rows and columns. And then um, the only difference is that uh, NumPy is gonna give you work in arrays uh, versus data frame is um, 
the data structure that pandas uses it's a little bit higher level um but yeah just, that's the main distinction but otherwise um you know the two are going to be the ones for working with data and data analysis um and then want to get the plotting really quickly um probably the more fun stuff and the lighter stuff but um so again, matplotlib is your tutorial is basically your plotting package for Python. Um, again, a pretty popular one. Um, you know, I'll let you guys kind of go through the uh, documentation at your own pace, and then also we'll you know go through an example plots. But basically, um, you know, I'll just show probably some examples here, right? So I think some examples would be good of kind of the plots you could typically create. So. I think this is a pretty good example. Uh, bar charts are your typical stuff. Uh, you could, you know, invert the axis if you'd like. Um, you know, you could you could break them up into panels. So for those of you that um, plot in R, um, a lot of, I think it's a common thing to try to break them up. Say if you're trying to subset or show categorical categorical data, it'll let you do panels. Um, you know, again, curves, plotting things like that. Um, you know, again, they, and then they get, you know, histograms, pretty typical, you know, the different ways you could represent data sets. Um, so again, I'll let you look through this on your own. But um, again, keep in mind that you can, you know, you do the initial plot, there's a tons of options usually with each one of these functions, and then you can kind of layer on the um, axis and other things like that. So let's pull up the bar chart example. I think this might be a good one. So yeah, this is a typical your conventional bar chart, right? Names on the, you know, names on the y-axis, um, you know, performance on the x-axis. Here's the code. Um, and again, I think, you know, loading the loading the um, library. They just set a random seed because they're generating a random data set. I think the key part is just right here, as I was illustrating. Is basically you, you know, you, you it's pretty procedural, right? You're going to set up your your people, which is you know your names, and then you basically set up your data set. And then from here, they start to, um, you know, include, you know, the different options, right? So this is kind of setting up the plot, you know, you know, working with the y-axis, working with the x-axis, labeling it, adding the title, and then basically rendering the plot at the end. So I think hopefully it's um, relatively interpretable as to um, setting up a plot, you know, pl first plotting the data and then doing all the annotations and other things around it. And then typically you can add things like legends, titles, axis, tick marks. You can scale the axis. You can scale the, the plot size if you'd like. So kind of all the normal stuff you'd, you'd expect from a plot. And then if you do this in Jupyter Notebook, as we'll see, you can actually just save it as an image again, which is super nice. So ways to get your work out of the uh, Jupyter Notebook. So that is matplotlib very quickly. And then I wanted to show you um, Seaborn, which is, the, as I said, is the um, Cadillac version. Um, of uh, matplotlib, it's actually built on matplotlib and um, so, so as you'll see from these upper ones like you could tell right away it's got the nice little like pastel colors. Um, also, the code itself is pretty interpretable. I'll give a gallery so you could tell like the plots look a little bit more polished, right? You have more color schemes. Um, you know, also the types of plots that they have out of the box are pretty good. They also start to introduce things like heat maps, which are pretty nice, which I use in a correlation heat map. Um, but you could tell like, yeah, some of these are going to be, you know, pretty well polished. Like this is, I think, almost very close to the one I used, but you could generate these. Um, you know, these, these correlation plots by just, and this is a silly example, right? But A through Z columns, and then it's just going for a correlation match. And then um, this is the code for it, but you could tell like the, the code is pretty clean, right? Like it's, you know, you could tell that Seaborn, it, it's built, you know, you bring in matplotlib because Seaborn's built on it. And then here again, we're just generating a random data set, calculating a correlation, because we need that for the heat map. And then in this case, um, I think this is, yeah, this is just to hide the upper triangle because you'll see like, you know, they, they whited this out so you could show focus of values on this side because otherwise you basically get a mirror image, right? Not that useful, right? So you really only need to see the values once, which is what you get here. And then, um, then really they kind of just set up the plot size here, nine by 11 for a full page. 
Um, this one I think is just the color shading so that you get the kind of colors that you do. And then from here, again, they, they put the options within the function itself, but really it's uh, Seaborn is the, what we're calling the, the package, so SNS. And then, um, you know, we go through and do the heat map and then, you know, we, we basically put in the options for it. And so it's, again, the code is relatively easy for what you get. You, don't, you It abstracts away a lot of the setup, right? And you certainly don't have to like do some sort of loop or anything crazy like that. It basically knows how to set up this grid and then plot all these values down. So um, again, there's a trade-off though, right? Because you can see like it's higher level code, but it's doing a lot, of, a lot of work on the back end. And if you want to customize, it probably will let you do most of what you want to do. But again, you're, you're, you're doing that trade-off there. So this is the Seaborn package. Yeah, so I think again, there, there's some fancier ones and you can do like, you know, hierarchical, they have like really fancy heat maps and all sorts of, you know, violin plots or the, you know, statistic, you know, statistical, um, you know, distribution, things like that. So anyway, all right. Um, and then last one, and, and then we can start diving more into the code is scikit-learn. We looked at this yesterday. So this is the main machine learning library in Python. Again, I think we talked about the different types of algorithms and models that you could use. Clustering is typically what you want to use as an exploratory visual aid, you know, to basically break up a data set, as you see here, breaking it up into um, examples. And then regression, again, is primarily for numeric data, um, which, you know, in our trash data set, we have um, basically trapped categorical data, right? Like, you know, high, medium, low. But again, if we were looking at trash levels or trash loadings, like actual so many gallons or cubic yards, then we would, you know, probably turn to regression. But, you know, again, we're going to be looking at classification and in, in particular, the uh, random forest um, classifier. And then again, some other additional information, if you'd like to read about it, about, you know, how to treat data, how to process it, things like that. So that. All right, is... Walter, is the random forest what we would use if we wanted to identify specific trash items? So to distinguish the, you know, bag from the bottle? Oh, sure. So if you're doing, you mean like in computer vision? Yeah. It does. So we used it as a separate model. So we, you know, we used uh, the CNN convolutional neural net yeah. and actually uh, scikit-learn also has neural nets. Um, so no, neural nets would be the, the better way to go about it because it's going to sweep the image. And so that's what TensorFlow, most, almost all of computer vision uh, typically we'll use neural nets because it's going to sweep and it's just going to, it's good for unstructured data, right? You're going to have, yep. what does it really do, right? It breaks the image down into like a big string of pixels and then it parcels down, you know, goes through the whole thing. And then it's going to make sense of the unstructured data. So CNN is typically the, uh, the way to go. And then however, random forest would be a good one. Once you say like in our example, when we identified the different, like in an image, if you have different metrics, like density, type of objects, type of object, um, then that would be a good one to actually make sense of the structured data once you got it back. But for the raw imagery, uh, you know, neural nets are gonna be the way to go. Great. So, and I think actually, it actually has, um, trying to find, uh, yeah, I think, uh, let's see. Here we go. So here's an example of the, um, here you go. So this is a super under at categorized under supervised learning, but they basically give you a, a pretty high level. Then this is again, more towards, um, this is really geared towards structured data. So if you're looking at structured data, like a lot of it, because usually neural nets are better on a lot of really large data sets, but um, these are basically good if you have multi-level categorical, categorical data. So maybe if you had like a data set, a really large data set, maybe with the type of trash it was, right? Like, the, that, like, is it a bottle? Is it a cigarette butt? Da, 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 da. Then it would be good at classifying more than just one level. Cause we'll see in our trash, um, you know, in our trash prediction, it basically makes, um, I mean, you could use random forest, but neural net just does very basically the same thing. You could do multi-class. You could basically, um, cause a lot of classifiers will basically say true or false. Like we talked mm -hmm. about like credit, 
is it true or false, yes or no? Is it basically it just makes one cut? But in this case, uh, when you want, uh, when you have multiple categorical variables, a neural net or a random force would be good because then that's what it could predict on is these different classes. And so mm -hmm. this uh, neural net is, yeah, it kind of goes through a bit of the math and then they talk about this is actually how you would set it up. And then this is the code, right? You would import the data set and then, you know, you're going to create, you're going to have some um, parameters you need to put in and then very simple, silly example, but they're just going to naively fit this, you know, without really doing much treatment. But if you're going to fit this in the classifier and then they're going to predict with it. But again, a big caveat is usually you need to do a lot more than just this. This is like, oh, just, you know, uh, download, see, use. <laughs> That's pretty much it. There's, there's no pre-processing or anything typically that you need to do, but just for illustrative purposes. So this is, um, yeah, this is the neural net that comes with scikit-learn. And actually you have, um, yeah, there's more to it. I mean, there's other stuff in this module, it looks like for supervised learning that you that you could use. So anyway, just FYI. Um, okay. And um, so with that, um, so I think these are the packages. So just wanna, you know, we imported the, the data analysis ones. We have the plotting. Matplotlib inline just means we're gonna create the plots within each cell of the, of the notebook, which makes it um, easier to, to download and use. Um, again, so the Seaborn plotting package, just wanted to set some configuration, don't worry too much about it, just setting the color code and theme, things like that. And then also a figure size so that we have full size plot, right? They're not coming out in little like tiles, right? We really want a full size plot. And then the um, scikit-learn library. So again, as I mentioned, I used the one for random forest. This is actually the neural net that we just looked at, though I didn't use it because I was, because we're looking at a, a multi-level data set for prediction, um, you kind of have to pick the model that you're going to use. So I was trying to research, but I didn't end up using it. Um, the next module is the train test, which is really useful for, well, train test, tr splitting the training and test data, right? That's one of the things that we want to do is basically do a split, right? 70%, yeah. 80%. Accuracy score and, con and confusion matrix, again, we'd like to be able to see what the performance of the model is. So that's what there's described, right? Be able to get an accuracy score and then generate a confusion matrix, which is the, the one we see at the, the ending. And the pre-processing is, is a pretty important one if you wanted to normalize your data and take you know, whatever typical data cleaning steps that you'd like, um, it allows you to do that. And then the workflow for scikit-learn is they have uh, what they call data pipelines or, or um, uh, I guess the model pipeline. So you're gonna feed your data through these particular steps and it saves it in the same object. And then you do the same thing for train tests. So you never forget, right? Because classical machine learning, right? You don't want to do like 10 steps on one on your training data and never and get it wrong on your test data. It's like going to mess up the entire model. So just really quickly, um, that's kind of how they treat um, uh, is they, they use pipelines. So this is the, the documentation around it, but basically, um, you know, you can read more about it on your own, but basically this is the way to do all of your processing, especially like normalizing, um, you know, standardization of your data, and then you're going to save it to a pipeline object. But again, uh, I guess in short is that, you know, again, relatively simple example, but you're going to do your, your split test, things like that, but you're going to set up your a pipeline object. And then from there, you're going to, you know, do some operations on it, and then you're going to retain it in this pipeline variable or object. And then you're going to do your train test and fit. So you carry everything with you. And then that way you don't have to worry about like carrying this big script around, making sure you get it all right. So it, it kind of helps you not make that those types of errors. So um, it was something I wanted to delve a little bit more into, but, you know, just kind of scraping together the example, of the notebook that I had, but um, you know, again, pretty neat feature of, uh, of scikit-learn, so. Um, so with that, I think um, we're pretty much ready to look at our open data set. So this cool. is the City of LA clean data set. So um, I've linked to it actually in this notebook. So if you're following along, um, you know, go ahead and just, you know, go ahead and uh, copy this and, you know, put it in your browser. So I'm gonna 
So this is the data set that you should see. So go ahead and, you know, if you'd like to follow along or you can just look at the screen share. This is the city of LA clean stack data set. There's a lot of documentation that goes with it, but you know, for the sake of this tutorial, just know that they basically did, you know, basically visual assessments, not OVTAs, but just visual surveys of trash levels. And if you want to read more about it, there's a whole story map that they put together and, and a lot more information about the data set. So again, you know, points to it being a, a good, reliable data set, right, that we could use. So, um, you know, I'll let you look through that on your own and then a look at the data. These are the columns that you have. But basically the important ones as you'll see it here in the descriptions are that um, basically it was um, a cleanliness score of one to three. And then based on the data distribution, we could probably assume, and I'm, I'm sure you could find it in the documentation, but um, you know, one and two being low and moderate and then three being high. And then they ranked primarily or scored primarily based on these four categories. So litter, weeds, bulky items, and illegal dumping. So those are the four general categories. So again, just for the sake of the tutorial, I focused in then on that, right? Like looking at, um, I think the score. So you could see that here. So you have the score here. So you have, I think it was the bulky items and then you have the, what is it? The, yeah, the illegal dumping, loose, uh, you know, litter, things like that. So there's four scores that correspond with it. And those are the ones that I focused on. And then also the seg score looked like it was a total score. And I'm seeing if we can do, usually sometimes here you can do a visualization of the data. Here we go. So here we can actually preview the data. So this is actually what the data looks like when we download it. So you can see that there's 38,000 rows. And then the link that I use in the code is this spreadsheet. So you could download it or, you know, in this case, we're going to do it programmatically. So as Eric pointed out, you could just download it directly from using Python. You don't have to go and download this every time. And then also each time you run it, if say there was an update on this data set, which it probably won't because it's snapshotted, but if it were, then you would just get that new version of the data set. And then as I described, there's geospatial data. So you could just as easily consume the geospatial uh, portion of it and get the boundaries on the parcels and and all the other stuff that they have, um, which I'm trying to see if you can see it. Yeah, they don't quite render it, I don't think, but um, they do have versions I've seen where they're, you know, there's actual lines on the street and that's what the geospatial data is for. Um, but this data set, you can see that um, basically everything's coded as zero, one, two, and three. So um, I, we probably have to look up what the meaning of zero is, but it seems like mostly, basically, these are categorical categorical variables coded as zero, one, two, three, but they're not really like say numerical data, right? They're not really continuous, right? They really represent. So you could basically swap out zero, one, two, three as like low, medium, high, right? And so you could treat these as or think of these as categorical variables, and then you could see that. Um, you know, pretty much the segment, you know, this is the segment ID that they checked. And then, you know, the, the scores of note are going to be the, um, you know, bulky score, the litter score, the weed score. And then I took a look and I, again, just putting this together really quickly as a proof of concept, but probably be good to verify, okay, like the seg score is the final one, right? It looked like this was the final score. Um, and then this is also the one I use an example to train on or to predict on is the, the actual final score of the data set. But this is kind of the, you know, and again, there's the geospatial. So, um, you know, there's, I think this is a, um, I think this is like a, poly, like a geospatial, um, what do they call it? Like a polygon or object representation. So it's a, it's an actual, it stores a lot long. So that the, the actual line work in there. So it's a, it's a geospatial object. And then that's kind of what you get for each row. Um, just again, trash level scores. And then, you know, it's got a unique ID and it's also got a segment ID. Uh, let's see, I think the segment ID didn't make too much sense. So probably the, the actual ID is the, the one that's, you know, assigned to the record. Um, so that's the data set. And then we will turn back now to the notebook. So 
this is the link, as I mentioned, right? We're just going to download the CSV. We've covered this before. So, you know, pandas.readcsv. We're going to bring it in. I'm just going to keep it simple. Call it DF, data frame. We're going to bring it in as a data frame. And then as we looked at the pandas documentation, we just look at dot head. So that's the first five rows, um, which technically we shouldn't be doing this. We should not be looking at the data before the split. However, just illustrative purposes. You just note for authenticity, if you're a purist, uh, we should have done the split first. So anyway, just FYI, uh, but we'll get to that later for instructional purposes. We're gonna do EDA first. So, uh, and then with that um, info, info is a really good one too. It gives you a little bit different visualization of the, your, your data. It gives you the column name, the number of columns, and then nulls, so if you have nulls, um, it'll tell you that too. And then it'll give you the data type, which is really nice. So you can see that, um, you know, int is, you know, numeric. And then uh, floats are decimals and so on and so forth. If you, there's one called object and that one like right here, this is string. That's just the way that pandas or Python gives it back to you. But just know that if you see object, it means string. And then again, these are the, the values that we see right here, right? When, you know, we go across the top here, we see these column names. And then, you know, we see these same column names going down here. Um, and then you can see, I mean, just, out of curiosity, right? It takes up about five megabytes of memory, you know, given that's 30,000 rows. And then uh, just as an example, we took the unique values. So I wanted to see what are the neat, because I think what I found was that this looked a little fishy, like full names. I don't know if it was all empty or not. I don't know what it was used for, but in this case, it looked like there were still unique values in here. Sorry. It looked like when I did unique on full name, I still got, um, a good number of names, right? So the field was being used. So I just want to make sure I didn't I didn't have to drop it or anything like that for the analysis. But it's just an example of the of the unique function to look at the unique values of a column. I'll we'll pause here for any questions on kind of up to this point downloading data, getting it stored in a data frame. It all makes sense. Okay. Sounds good. I want to make sure I'm not going too fast. Um, uh, may I ask a question? Uh -huh, sure. Sorry. So, uh, the there's uh, would you uh, move up a little bit? So there's something related to the shape, right? Uh, what was that? The 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 polygon or things like that. The geodesic yeah. shape and that's a value. Um, right. Yeah, it's, like right here. Yeah. Yeah. So is this like? A, do they have like a certain type of like a presentation for, uh, because the shape is a, a area, right? And this is a number. So do you know? Yeah, that's what I, that's what I was thinking is, I think it's um, like Esri has, a, I think, cause this is hosted on Esri hub. So oh, I have okay, this okay. your geo file geo database. So I think, um, it, it's tied to a uh, GIS shape file. So that's an automated field when you create a shape file in uh, ArcGIS, which is what ESRI is. Right. Um, okay. And if you scroll on that download, you could download the actual shape file. Um, and a shape file is a geospatial data. So if you open it in QGIS as a free GIS software, you would see the streets like overlaid on LA. So this is like a unique identifier for the particular shape, something like that. Uh, it's it's just the length, probably in feet, of the segment of the street. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So okay. they used like a line work of like a center line of streets. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, let's see. So. Um, so yeah, thanks for the clarification, Taylor. Yeah, um, and I think, yeah, this is just one way of, and this is uh, what it renders as, and I'll go back to the overview really quickly, is I'm gonna show the story map really quick, and I think it's there, or maybe just the map itself, let's see. So this is the visualization of the actual data once it's on a map. So this is the showing of those um, locations. So this is what it looks like. So you actually get all these lines for each block and everything that they looked at. And then let's take a look at, uh, here we go. So uh, not clean, so that's their categorization, right? So green is clean, yellow is somewhat, and 
red is not. So you could think of it as high, medium, low, right? So that's how it, it correlates is basically one, two, and three. Um, and that's how it's represented within the data set. And so um, in this column for each one, that was, uh, you know, the, uh, sorry, the data looking at this, you know, this uh, geospatial column, um, it's trying to represent that piece of it on the map. So this field. So, but for the intents of the, of the analysis, um, obviously it doesn't, it's not like lat long where you could use it potentially to make sense of the data. Um, I mean, it's just like literally a number that kind of rolls up the, the value. So I didn't, you know, I really just focused on the scores for the sake of the data set. So um, for the analysis for the train of prediction. So um, I think as we talked about too, once we have the data set ready, I think one of the first things is to look at that distribution score. So basically, um, you know, looking at wanted to make sure that uh, just in case when I was doing a plot, I, I wanted to make sure I didn't have any null values in the seg score. So I just do, you know, like we talked about, right? You could, you know, call a column, put a function, right? Drop any as described, it'll drop any rows that contain null values only within this column. And then want to do uh, a distribution plot. So seaborn dot, you know, distribution. And then again, set title on the plot. So the kind of as described, pretty high level code. Um, and in this case, that's what it's giving me. It puts the title on this plot and then it goes ahead and builds in, as we can see that the, the majority of scores here are on the low. And it kind of makes sense, right? If we look at this, you know, this map visually, um, if you're looking at, you know, it looks like there's a lot of outlying areas. We also are not quite sure within here. There might be a lot of green tucked in here. Visually, it seems to make sense. Um, but anyway, so this is at least of the data set that we have. This is, you know, again, the distribution and we see that there's some high values down here. And then one more plot. And again, this is just for illustrative purposes and get a better sense of the data set. But basically um, in this case, uh, we're doing a heat map. And in that case, what it does is remember, we talked about creating that correlation for the entire table. So in order to do so, it can't take a correlation of, of a string, right? Or of numeric text. So that's why I dropped this whole name column, right? Because it's um, basically, it, it's, a, it's text, right? So I can't use it to calculate. And then also uh, the one is here because uh, remember we talked about rows and columns. And so one means it's gonna drop a column. That's it's what they call an axis. So if you think of as, um, remember when we were looking at those visuals with the little tables, uh, the row, row wise is zero. So if I want to drop a row, I just do zero. If I want to drop a column, it's, you know, one for a column. That's just the convention they follow. So that's why the one is there. So basically this is telling, uh, you know, pandas or the day frame drop the full name column. And again, I just do it with this one line. And then after that, I just want to make sure, you know, just get a glimpse of this data set before I go ahead and calculate the correlation. And in this case, um, you know, it looks like it's no longer there, right? I just have numeric columns here. And then, you know, in the plot function, I go ahead and calculate the correlation, you know, do that in one step. Gonna give it a palette because the, the one it came out with was like ah, purple and yellow and ah, it was just not very pretty. And uh, then I put a title on it. And then again, I chain that to the, to the plotting function. And then I go ahead and get this. So again, hopefully pretty interpretable. Again, you know, I think most plotting will be like this, whether you do an R or MATLAB, um, it'll be pretty, should be pretty easy to follow. I think the one thing is just knowing, okay, I can only do numeric values per correlation. And then also knowing that, hey, I, I can tuck all these little features in here. But um, actually I wasn't, I, I gotta give credit to these links anyway, because I, you know, just reference the tutorial. So like we talked about like snippets of code and examples, you could pretty much create these, um, you know, like we saw in the heat map example. So that's the one I used to uh, generate this heat map. And it was, we can see that it wasn't as informative as I had hoped. Um, you know, I think we see that, well, you know, going down this really, this, these reds, so from zero to one, red is really the, you know, a high, you know, one correlation, right? But these are really just the correlation with, you know, each column with itself, you know, doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Um, the only one would be, it looks like, 
you know, you kind of see some matches with like this between the score and it, it looks like this is another metric by the same item. So weed to weed, litter to litter. So not too useful. Um, you know, it looked like down here, you know, again, just interpreting this plot, it looked like, you know, these scores obviously contributed to the seg score as we can see here in the, the second to last row. But again, just visually inspecting the data, looking at, hey, or is there some sort of correlation? And especially if we're doing a regression, right? We'd wanna know, okay, if like A is highly correlated to B, we might wanna think about that as before we do the analysis. So, you know, again, just getting a look at the data. All right, diving in, um, now getting our machine learning hats on. So hang on to your seats, folks. Here comes the fun part. So uh, we are going to do a, a model train, train model fit on our data set, right? We're ready to go. We got our data. We've looked at it. We cleaned it. Good to go. So this first set is basically um, we're going to filter and subset on just these columns. Again, making the example easier, also giving the model a bit, little easier of a time if we know that we're only interested in the score. So again, I chose these four scores and then the seg score is the final. And then also just in case I want to know what the object ID is, right? If I want to output this or do different types of, um, you know, I guess report, you know, reporting out, I want to know what the record is. So anyway, just subset for these number of rows. And then in this case, I just wanted to kind of take a look at, um, I used the, remember the train test split. So I'm going to split this data. And this basically tells it, hey, split me 20% for test, 80% for train. And more, most importantly, we set it to two different variables. So we set aside the test. We never look at test again. Like that's a cardinal thing. Like we never, you know, we only work on the training data and only when we do prediction, then do we use the test data, always, always. So whether you're doing computer vision, sound, you know, sound and out, whatever it is, you always set aside your test set, don't cheat. Cause what will happen is the, the, the classifier will, will memorize that. It's basically cheating on the exam. Yeah. You know, when you give it like you're basically training this uh, this classifier, right, with the training data. But if you show it the answers, well, guess what it's going to give you back when you go train. And then when you give it new data, it's not going to perform very well. So just uh, just FYI. And then in that case, we just want to verify the train test split after we do it. And we'll see this down below in the output. Um, and then also a little bit of explanation here. But basically what we do is this is an X and Y. And so notice too that there's a train and there's a test. So we're preparing this basically the, the train is going to be for our training phase. The test will be for, you know, testing our actual model and, and making sure how, you know, taking a look at the results and the train, basically we know looking at this data that we have um, seven columns, right? So seven columns and remember it's indexed at zero. So zero, one, two, three, four, five, six is the last one, the one we want to predict on. So what we do in these lines of code, and you almost always have to do this, whether if you have a drag and drop builder, great, like in, I don't know, Amazon or something, but if you're doing it in R or what have you, you typically almost always have to do these kind of setups for the, for the data. But what we do here is for each data set, we basically set it aside because we're gonna, you know, train on X and then we're going to have this kind of prediction variable, right? So we're going to set this as the, uh, the one to train on or the one to, you know, basically rate ourselves on so the classifier knows. And then the only thing I think I did as well was to make sure that um, the Y when I scored it, like it had, I think it was a float and it wasn't too happy. So as you'll see, like up here, it looked like a number. Like when I was trying to predict on seg score, but actually you'll see some, there's some decimals here. So it, as a classifier, obviously it's going to want a score or an integer. And so that's what we do here in this. Um, we basically make sure that it's an integer value. And then again, just some verification to see what we're doing. And then after that, we're pretty much ready to feed it in our classifier. So we, so you exclude, you exclude any rows that have uh, decimals. Um, or do you we round? Just cast it. So it's basically when we do the as type, it's casting it or converting it from a, a float into the integer. So, so it does it way. does a rounding. Exactly. So it's going to do the rounding and then you get that. And then we feed it after that, we put it into the classifier or the random, you know, this is the function that we call. It gives, it returns the model object to you for you because 
as you'll see, there's both a fit and predict. And then as you'll see, we only, again, use the training data. We're going to fit this model and look at our results in the next cell. And then these options here are basically the defaults, but, um, you know, basically just give it a random seed, you know, you know, number of estimators, you know, basically like the weak classifiers you want to throw at each node, things like that. And then, um, you know, again, just bear in mind, then now we've trained it and we have the RF model, which we'll be using. And I guess maybe we can just scroll back up. Let's practice running each cell, right? So we can scroll back up. So again, if you're, if you're working through this, right? So I'm gonna go ahead and import the code. I just, you know, I go ahead and hit run, right? It's gonna run, it's gonna do our circle, right? So just for an exercise. So it's running, it's run. And then, you know, everything's output here. And then we get to this first plot, right? Remember I said, you can always save this as an image if you'd like. So if you wanna put it as a presentation or anything like that, you could just save it as an image. We just do a run and then voila, it's rerun now. So it's the same output, same thing on plot two. So remember, we're just creating this correlation plot. So as you can tell, it runs pretty quickly, right? Over 30,000 rows of data, it you know, it, it's pretty, pretty easy going, doesn't it? Yeah, um, that's that's pretty fast. Uh, just to pause for a second, Ying, you had a you had a question. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, may, may I ask, uh, how did you uh, do the tuning of the hyperparameters, like the 100 in the random forest? Is that a, like a, you just random pick one or you did a certain like a tuning in order to do that? I think that was almost a default. <laughs> Okay. I guess right. that's um, yeah. No, and that's a really good point though. So Scikit-Learn has um, parameter tuning tools available. Um, so I think it's, um, yeah. So they, they basically give you some tools to do optimization. So uh, let's, yeah. So the two popular ones I think are randomized search and grid search. And I'll let you kind of walk, you know, read through these. And I think they have probably a set of documentation yeah, so they have the randomized parameter optimization. So they basically loop through and they find the best parameters for each model. So you can basically set these, um, you know, where you can, you know, the, you, you have to do a little bit of setup, but um, these are tools that are built in with Scikit-Learn to help you define those optimum, uh, basically parameters to feed into the model. So let me put this into the chat. Does that help answer the question? Yes, thank you. Okay. So yeah, I think there were a couple things that I was thinking of. I mean, probably don't have time to get to it. I was thinking about, you know, ways to improve this um, example. And I, you know, the ones I was thinking of was, um, you know, a couple ways to improve this was, yeah, obviously do some um, parameter tuning so that, you know, the one, the thing that Ying was mentioning about was, um, you know, do we know necessarily that 100 is the best? We don't. Um, randomized seed, not really, but others are probably also maximum depth the trees. Um, I didn't select any, but does it make a difference? We don't know. But, you know, optimizing these parameters would be useful to help, you know, increase performance. Um, also, the location of the train test split, and then also managing the imbalance data set. Those are the couple of things I could think of to help improve this model. But again, this is for illustrative purposes mostly. So, this is again just some verification, no real output here. This is just telling us, okay, we. You know, and these are, this is an example of all the different kind of options you could put. And that's why sometimes it's, you know, actually it is really useful to have um, scikit-learn or some other tool to help you find what are some of these optimum um, parameters to be adding. So with that said, the next part, so this is where, um, you know, assuming everything went well, and I know I, I went through relatively quickly in the last section, I think the hard part here is really, and actually when I was building it, I think the most, I spent a lot of time here to make sure I got everything formatted correctly. And really this whole data cleaning and structure, I spent some time here, but once I got to the classifier, it was pretty much smooth sailing. So just FYI, if you're, if you want to use another model, if you want to use this data set and say, I wanted to use another scikit-learn model, um, in many ways, I think that the work's already been done. But just note too that if you change the model, make sure that you know you're you're giving it what it expects, and it should be okay. Where you have an X Y and everything should go okay. But just uh, typically, a lot of time is spent, you know, just making sure that the data is in the right format and things like that. 
Walter, I don't need a lot of detail for this answer, but what do errors look like if let's say you're, you didn't apply that the casting is integer 64? Oh, it'll tell you, I think for that one, it gave me, um, it'll just tell you the classifier doesn't, it, it basically, it'll tell you it expects an integer. It'll okay. tell you, it won't tell you which one it, it's in, but it'll tell you um, basically, yeah, that the random forest expects an integer as a, as a value. And then you know, okay, then you know how to cast it. Yeah. Right, okay. Mm -hmm. And so next, um, basically the next step is once we've trained it, then we go ahead and turn to now our test data, right? So remember, uh, we're gonna go now go do a prediction. So this is the step where, okay, now that we trained our model, it's ready to go. We then test it on X underscore test. So we only, we don't wanna look at this data. And then this accuracy score is then, we basically make our prediction and then we compare it against the actual values. So we basically set, we almost like set aside twice, right? We set aside both the train test and then we set aside the answer, so to speak, right? That, you know, that last seg score column. And then we compare it so that we get an actual accuracy score. And then this is how we're gonna calculate the, um, you know, accuracy is very kind of loose and not that, you know, really the, the confusion matrix or, you know, some other metric, right? Like mean average, mean average precision, you know, um, you know, rock and, and, and uh, AUC curves are probably more useful, but accuracy is just a very rough measure, right? Like of the ones that we, you know, we just make a prediction, we compare against what the actual answers are. But I think the, the confusion matrix are probably the more, you know, actually putting in the predictive values, comparing what, what the answers are. And then you'll see in the output here actually showing, okay, like, how many of the true scores did we get? And then making sure, okay, how many false positive and negatives did we get as well? So, and then you can also, I didn't quite get to it, but um, you could probably do like an AUC or a rock curve just to show another visualization of your recall and, and things like that. So there's a number of different ways to look at the metric. And it basically, most will work once you do a predicted. So that the workflow is you train and then you test and then you, you, you assign the predicted values to basically a, another data frame. And then you feed this predicted into, if you wanted a, a, a rock curve, if you wanted a, um, you know, like in this case, you're gonna calculate accuracy. It, it kind of all feeds around the predicted and then the you know, Y test, which, is, which are the actual answers. So, you know, it's like, in this case, a, a crude analogy would be, you've now given the algorithm your tests, like, Solve these, you know, make these make these estimates, right? That's predicted. It says, okay, here's what I think the, the, the answer should be. And then the Y underscore test is like the, the answer key going, okay, here are the actual answers. And then that's what we're using to compare, you know, a, you know, accuracy and, and the confusion matrix and all the other stuff. And so if you wanted, again, if you wanted to look at it at different ways, as long as you, if you have these two values, uh, you should be okay. But that's the primary way, you know, basic way of setting it up. And then I think this is, yeah, this is kind of, um, you know, again, not a mo the most complete example, you know, again, lots of things we could be doing, but just wanted again to illustrate and, ooh, we got to go back at 2.30. <laughs> yeah, we have just, just a in few time. Minutes. Whoa. <laughs> so anyway, so I guess uh, time for questions then. <laughs> I don't know, Scott, um, how much you saw. Huh? Yeah, I, I caught I caught the past like twenty minutes or so, um, okay. and I, I I'm glad that it was recorded. We're gonna have an access access to that recording, right? Yep. Cool. I will need to review the air the hour that I missed. Um, I guess I'm wondering more generally, like, what's a good, what's like a good prediction? Like, I guess it's probably like, you know, scenario dependent, right? But yeah, if you're doing, um, you know, probably it depends on your use case. So like when we did our trash our OBTA assessments. We did a literature study. So typically for whatever use case you're doing, and I'm, I don't know, Tony, if you got a chance, like with the team, you may have done some literature review of what, what you get. Um, that's usually a pretty good one. Rule of thumb, it's hard to say. It depends on the model that you're using. Um, typically more, probably the one to be more aware of is overfitting, underfitting. So if typically if you're using more complex models like neural nets, it'll bump up your score, but you might be overfitting, which means that it's memorizing the, the, because it's a more complex data set, right? So if you think of like the curve, uh, like, uh, let me show you like, um, 
So if you're like trying to predict based on something like this, like this spline, right? Well, if you use a neural net, it's going to get really good. It's going to know, okay, I'm going to trace every single point on the line, right? Versus a more simpler, like linear regression, it might do like steps, right? But when you throw new data at it, it's just going to try to cut it. You know, it just knows to follow this line really precisely. So there's a risk of overfitting with more complex models. So there's that trade-off, like you're getting more precise on the training, but when you test, you might have, you know, your, your performance may vary. Um, you know, in this case, on the example, you know, we got a really high score. Sorry, I, I hit the not share it. Sorry, let me share the screen real quick. Um, yeah, I, I would I would say so just to jump in just because I want to I want to make sure I could share just one observation here. Uh, one key thing, Scott, to bear in mind is is uh, what is your measure of truth? So in the case of trash, uh, where you're dealing with real world scenarios, um, your measure of truth could be how much trash is there really in the environment outside of kind of um, human, human seeing and insight, right? So a human might see five bottles, but there are really eight, okay? There are really eight that can be collected through scouring and maybe even like removing vegetation and then finding, oh, there was a, there was a bottle underneath there, right? So is your measure of truth therefore what the human can perceive or how many bottles there really are. So that's one thing. The other thing is to measure the um, uh, levels of imprecision uh, among practitioners of, of, um, in terms of observation. And I think that Walter, your example of the OVTA and doing comparisons as to how much variability there are um, among different practitioners was useful as that, as that key example. So if in other words, if uh, you go out and uh, you do an assessment that's on, scored on an A, B, C, D, and you know there's variability of 20% among all of the practitioners, then if you're able to account for that in your success rate uh, of identification or matching that, that's that level of vari variability, then you can say that's a, that's a very clear success because then you're, the variability of the, of the automation is matching the natural variability among practitioners. So those are those are a couple different ways to measure success, I would say. And they're almost kind of two very different things to, to use as a basis of, of measuring. Thanks, Tony. And then how do you how do you determine overfitting? Like what what parameters can you monitor for that? Uh, you want Tony? Yeah, yeah, can... go, go ahead, Walter. Uh, in general, the notion is if you're if you're overfitting, your performance will drop. So once you train, if you train at like 99 and it drops to like 85 or 90, when you do a test, then it just means yeah, you you've overfit the data. Also, a precision or a, sorry, a recall is going to be a good one. I think you do the what they call a rock or ROC curve. So I think this is let me show you real quickly. Um, So yeah, something like this where um, you're actually measuring, you know, how how the model is actually performing. So there's you you go by the right, yeah, you kind of go by um, area under the curve, and and it basically measures very closely on true, you know, against uh, false positive, false negatives. So it, it's just a much cleaner metric of of the predictions you're making, how many of the of them are actually correct instead of just looking blindly like, okay, I'm, I'm getting everything correct on the training data. It's actually looking pretty closely at the test data. But I think that's why the, the metrics are more important rather than just accuracy. Um, but those are the ways to look at, okay, like, again, making sure that um, I'm predicting correctly. Yeah, so these are all the different metrics by which, um, you know, they're, they're taking variations of making sure, okay, like what we actually predict is a true positive and it, and it makes sense. And um, you know, comparing that against um, the uh, the different scores. So I will let you. I'll just think. I mean, we have like a minute left, but um, does that answer it? I mean, I, just really quickly, without delving too much. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks. Yeah, I would say yeah, definitely precision recall. Um, AUC ROC curves, com confusion matrices are really good because you're comparing against true metrics versus just oh, I'm, I'm testing really well or training really well because that could be super misleading, especially if you then test and, and then your performance just drops off, so. 
All right. Um, any final before we get pulled back in for the report out? Walter, did we really cover the um, uh, the the, the uh, visualization work that you wanted to do? Uh, not exactly. Not in the minute that we have. <laughs> um, well, before.